We are still on alcohol issues, and the next bill up for our consideration is 23 LSO Working Draft 118, Tavern and Entertainment Liquor Licenses. You'll remember this from our last two meetings. At our last meeting, we did ask LSO uh, to explore some definitional language so we could get a better handle on if we are going to do a tavern license, what entertainment uh, might detail. So, Ms. Johnson, welcome. If you could go through the uh, potential amendments and wording to the bill since our last meeting. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, as already stated uh, at the last meeting, uh, the, the committee asked for an amendment uh, regarding a definition for entertainment. I came up with a few different um, potential definitions based on the conversation we had at the last meeting. And obviously the committee can add or subtract from these or disregard them as a uh, as necessary. For the first potential amendment, um, that would be adding a Wyoming statute 124416J, and it would authorize the licensing authority to, to determine on a case by case basis the types of entertainment that qualify for a tavern and entertainment liquor license. And Ms. Johnson, this is the staff comment slash amendment oh, uh, found I'm on sorry. page six? On, on page six, I apologize. So, committee run page six of the bill, which is 171 in your electronic packet. Go ahead. The second potential amendment would be to create a Wyoming statute 121101A paragraph um, 28, which would be a definition of entertainment. It would read, entertainment means any of the following forms of recreation, indoor concerts, comedy shows, dancing, escape room games, fashion shows, movies or films, performance art, karaoke, sports simulators, arcade games, art exhibits, and bowling. And obviously the committee could expand or detract from that list as it wishes. Um, the third potential amendment is another possible definition of enter entertainment, which would read, entertainment means recreational activities that occur on the premises of one facility that involve at least one of the following, games of skill, musical concerts, films, live performing arts, dancing or art exhibits. The fourth potential amendment prohibits certain forms of entertainment and reads, entertainment shall not include any activity involving in-person nudity or, or any form of gambling. And I would stand for any questions. So in person, so not in-person nudity would be like a film. Right. Is that where the kind of the weird differentiation there of in-person nudity comes I, in? I attempted to different, differentiate, yes. Committee, any questions on any of those four avenues moving forward as we're looking to further kind of tailor this legislation um, to a workable fashion on whether or not we define entertainment? And if we do define entertainment in options two, three, or four, um, those are the choices before you. Otherwise, we could leave it to the local licensing authority to determine on a case-by-case -case basis what's appropriate for that local licensing community. Any questions for Ms. Johnson? Seeing none at this time. Thanks, Anna. Uh, with that, we'll open it back up. Um, I don't know if the Department of Revenue has any comments to overseas liquor on this bill. I see Mr. Montoya and Director Henson here. Just here to observe the uh, party. All right, we'll open it to general public comment unless the Liquor Association has thoughts on this bill. I suppose. As the association that deals with liquor on a statewide basis, Mr. Mosier, We'll have you testify first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Once again, Mike Mosier, Wyoming State Liquor Association. Uh, we oppose this bill as written, and I'll get into the details. Uh, but on the other hand, I think there's still a potential. Uh, so turning to page six, and I'll actually page by page this instead of because it's uh, got a lot of stuff in it. Uh, on line nine, I don't think food should be part of this. If it's an entertainment establishment, food should not be part of the factor. So you, you don't want an establishment going back to the local licensing authority and said, eh, we did 20% skill games, 25% food, 5% trivia games, 10% quarters, quarters or any other thing. Uh, it should be an entertainment business. Uh, and I'll get into what I would consider entertainment uh, committee. Uh, at the bottom of page six, 
uh, indoor concerts and comedy shows. Uh, I had, and I'll refer to this a couple times afterwards, I had the ability to poll a number of my liquor peers, if you will, around the country on these issues. And as I mentioned in prior testimony, I did find a couple cases where states did have what one state calls a cabaret liquor license, uh, minim minimum seating requirements, live entertainment, uh, whether it's a comedy show, whether it's a concert, whatever. And that was the primary focus of business. Uh, I think of if you're acquainted at all with Cheyenne, there's an establishment downtown that's a converted theater. Uh, and I don't think anybody would deny that that establishment does add something community. It has lots of shows and a lot of activities. And we actually did something similar for civic centers uh, back a few years back. So turning to page seven. <clears throat> uh, well, committee, I can't think of anybody who charges for dancing. Uh, the only people I can think of that might charge for dancing are actually precluded at the bottom of that page. Uh, so I don't think dancing is really a form of entertainment that is paid for. Dancing takes place. But on the other hand, I don't see that in the definitions. Escape room games, I think the best thing about this thing, that being in the bill is it forced a lot of us to Google to figure out what that was. Uh, although I, <laughs> and in talking to people who have actually done them, they're rather intense little five minute affairs that you do once or twice. It's not something you go back every Saturday and do. Uh, I don't think that's a thing. It isn't a thing in most places. So dancing in escape room games, I don't think really need to be in these definitions. Fashion shows, I assume there are fashion shows in Wyoming, but I don't know who made the charges for them. So once again, it's not a revenue driver. And remember that this needs to be a significant portion of your revenue. Then we get into movies or films. Uh, most movie theaters in Wyoming that have liquor license or want a liquor license have one because most of them serve food. Uh, on the other hand, I know of a place in the northwestern corner of the state, and I've heard there's a place in the center of the state that is a converted, that is a movie theater that runs films that is having issues in the northwestern corner of the state. I'm not quite sure why, because restaurant license I would think would work. But once again, if you make the investment to have, for example, 75 seats and entertainment is your primary focus, it's not unlike we've done with rodeos, with airports, with civic centers, you are willing to put a chunk of money or resort licenses. You're willing to put you're willing to put a chunk of money out to further your, the entertainment in the community. Performance art, uh, I you know instead of having uh, indoor concerts, comedy shows, performance art, basically live performances, uh, entertainment performances, uh, karaoke. Um, I don't know of anybody that charges for karaoke. The last time I saw one, I think they should have been charged because it was miserable. Uh, now we get into the details with sports simulators and arcade games. When I inquired to my peers, as far as if anybody had liquor licenses addressed, uh, sports simulators or arcade games, uh, I got some chuckles, but I didn't get any affirmatives. Uh, the difficulty is, is in the definition. I mean, this is in the definition, but there's no definition. Uh, with sports simulators, we've heard about some examples. But on the other hand, with sports simulators, you're also talking about my virtual reality headset. Or we're talking about, for those of you who play video games, which most of you probably don't, or watch football, uh, games like Madden, which has been around for decades that lots of people play. So we're not just talking uh, a big screen and a lot of investment. We're talking about pretty basic stuff. And it's pretty tough to pin that down uh, and highly seasonable, may I add. I did talk to people who run golf simulators and shooting simulators. And the problem is the people that do those things, I'm not the former, but I'm certainly the latter. And I've done gun simulations and the poof of air and the simulated stuff. They're good for training, kind of, for those of you, and I'm looking at you, Representative Burt. They're useful for training site reacquisitions <laughs> and double taps but they aren't as much fun as shooting because uh, you don't get that wonderful smell of gun oil and gunpowder and you don't get the feel of recoil. Same is true with live golf. So those businesses tend to do pretty well when it's too cold to do anything. But other than that, most people who enjoy those sports are outside doing them. And so arcade games, my question is what demographic are we looking for? 
because most people I know play arcade games probably shouldn't be in bars. We are talking about 21 or over formats. And so we go into art exhibits. Once again, I don't know of anybody who charges for those. And bowling alleys, I don't know of any bowling alley who doesn't have a liquor license already that would want one because they all serve food as far as I know. And so they have alternate types of liquor licenses. So that being said, committee, and I'll get into this more later, uh, I can see, I don't know if we would say we support, but I can see businesses that make the, event, the, the investment of live performance acts or renovating a movie theater with a minimum seating capacity. Now, the reason you want a minimum seating capacity is if you say films or movies, well, I'll just buy a bar and set up an L eight millimeter in the corner and charge a $20 cover charge uh, and charge $2 for beers. If you think that's funny, because it kind of is, when there was one city that ran a smoking ban and exempted smoke shops, uh, entrepreneurial club decided to sell cigarettes for $5 a piece and sell beer for two bucks because it put them over the 50%. Uh, to qualify as a smoke shop. You can do that same kind of cost adjusting. And when you include food, ladies and gentlemen of the committee, when you include food, remember food isn't just food, it's everything non-alcoholic. And so you add that factor in, and you're talking about a business that may not be doing a whole lot in other things. And as I mentioned, with the seasonal nature of some of these sports activities, you're basically just talking about a bar that's struggling for the same shrinking demographic that goes to bars as we're currently struggling over. Uh, so committee, we get into the second, and I assume by the way I read these, there are, these are alternative definitions. Under three, uh, games of skill, and I think somebody's going to address this later because I'm not sure what that refers to, whether it refers to skill-based amusement games or whether it refers to like the game where you put the quarter in and it gets a claw and pulls out a stuffed animal. Uh, if it's skill-based amusement games, there probably should be a statutory reference. Uh, with musical concerts, we tie back into what I was referring to before. With a minimum seating area, with a minimum investment, I can understand it. Like I said, I don't know if I support it. Films, that follows up. Live performance arts, once again, dancing. Are you talking about dancing performance? Or are you talking about charging for dancing, which is completely different, and then art, art exhibits. Uh, one of the things that's interesting, committee, is in this bill is what's not in this bill that can be read into this bill. Uh, rodeos, no matter what size, well, bigger ones can have liquor licenses, but is that a performance art? Uh, you can have a mechanical bull, but you can't have a rodeo uh, because a mechanical bull would be a sports simulator. Uh, other sporting events. You can play Madden football, but you can't have football. And so there's a lot of vagueness, especially when we get into sports simulators and arcade games that greatly concerns me because committee, as you well know, if there's a loophole in liquor laws, people find it pretty quick. And so the way this is defined, like I said, if you narrow it down to Live performances, live performances where the bulk of the money in the business is comes from ticket sales or movies and theaters and do a minimum seating, you begin to follow something that actually may make some sense. But when you include the potpourri of other things whose definition with arcade games and sports simulators, that changes every year. We're going to have to go back to statute and pin down what we really mean. Uh, I mentioned the virtual reality committee. Uh, I have my virtual reality headset. I can do almost every, I know, I'm the older demographic that plays that stuff. I play a lot of virtual sports on my little headset, and we're reaching the point where you can move around and, and virtually pay, play tennis. And so will that be the next, do we include virtual reality? What else do we include? I don't see that being the debate as a big apologies of anyone who wants it. I don't see it as basis. And I also don't hear a lot of calls for that, uh, except for one who are my friends. I haven't heard anybody saying now that being said, we do have a place that has an arcade in downtown Cheyenne, which is a wonderful business, but they serve food. They have a full retail liquor license and it's a full family entertainment center uh, that I can see, but Arcade games by themselves, I don't really see a as a basis of a business. 
Uh, I will not get into, although I believe somebody else will, under Section 4, obviously the first one I will not address because I'm a gentleman. The second one I will address just because, once again, there are no definitions. There's a difference between gaming and gambling. Do we mean bingo and pull tabs? Do we mean skill-based amusement games? Do we mean historic horse racing? What exactly do we mean by gambling? So, committee. The solution to me, uh, I see this as having so many loopholes, we are going to be entertained by the number of loopholes that people exploit to get a liquor license. And I had mentioned in testimony before, and I promised myself I wouldn't be redundant, uh, that there is a negative effect on our communities, on law enforcement, on economic development, of proliferation of what we call alcohol, al alcohol outlet density. You heard Mr. Odekoven last meeting, CDC's got an expansive study. So liquor licenses are the kind of thing that are a good thing, but we need to make sure that we just don't go crazy on it because you end up with other problems too. If you focus on live performance arts or movie theaters with a minimum seating capacity, I can see some merit can't guarantee would support it, but I think it makes a lot more sense. So with that committee, I'm just trying to find solutions, Mr. Chairman. I think the committee is pretty confident on where you're coming from and what your perspective is, I, Mr. Moser. Well, I'm kind of careful, Mr. Chairman, because I tend to be very brief and concise, and so uh, hopefully I wasn't too brief. And so uh, it, uh, I seem to be putting Representative Duncan to sleep. Uh, is that a no vote? At, um, at the, our own risk, Mr. Moser, you did not uh, discuss Section one on the licensing authority on a case by case basis can determine for themselves what they may. Th Does the Liquor Association have thoughts on that perspective? Uh, oh, Mr. Chairman, one thing we've always stood steadfast by is the ability of local licensing authority to decide what what they want or don't want with liquor licenses, whether it's a refusal, denial, whatever. Did you almost call me Reverend? Is that what that was? Hmm? None. Um, any questions for Mr. Mosier? or the State Liquor Association on their perspective on this bill? Seeing none. Thank you, Mr. Much. Mr. Thank Mosier. You, Mr. Chairman. Uh, well, let me just start on this side of the room. People testify on this bill. Ms. Wilkinson, you're giving me that look. Maybe. You just didn't want to go first. Thank you. Welcome. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Catherine Wilkinson here on behalf of Coward Skill and Paysomatic uh, with no position on the bill, just um, offering a piece of clarification in form of amendment should the committee choose as a policy decision to go with options three or four. Just wanted to point out to the committee with this drafting that games of skill does not refer to skill games in case there was confusion since they tend to be called skill games they are defined in statute as skill based amusement games so it asked the committee that clarifying statute do be put in there so. Um, games of skill are actually bona fide contest of skill within title six of the gambling statute so if that's what you're looking for you need a separate game uh, a separate definition for actual games of skill as far as I know. There's not one in statute. Um, if you're looking for the gambling statute in totality, it's a 6-7-101, uh, subsection A, 3, large A. Um, the second point that I wanted to just um, educate the committee on, if you do choose option four with gambling, again, I would ask that you specifically clarify that with more um, statutory definition. Um, it's just a little unclear the way it is currently reading. So thank you. Questions? Ms. Matic. None. Thank you much. Ms. Urbicat, I'm guessing you want to go next. Uh -huh. It's not often people jump to their feet. Welcome to corporations. Floor is yours. Take the one that's already on. Hi, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Lori Urbekite, I'm representing Wyoming Horse Racing LLC. Um, we would prefer that you go with option one and allow the local communities to make the determination of what they believe entertainment is. If you, however, decide to go with option two, <clears throat> we would ask that you insert or add paramutual events um, to that list. That would cover our OTBs. Now, most of our OTBs um, in Wyoming are already located in liquor establishments. 
Um, there are some that are not. There's one here in Cheyenne that is not. Um, but that could be a real option for them if they're in communities that that are, you know, don't have that kind of facility or, or place to, to locate. If you go with option one, then that's up to the local municipality to decide and paramutual events are only allowed in I believe 13 counties now maybe maybe 12 13 something like that so um, obviously we prefer option one L let the local municipalities decide but if you go with two then please add paramutual events questions for horse raising seeing none thank you thank you other people generally this side of the room going by to testify on which one of these definitions they might want to see. Anybody else wish to testify on the bill? Mr. Johnson, Councilman Johnson. Welcome to corporations. Thank you so much. All right. For those of you who don't know me, I am Cheyenne City Councilman Richard Johnson representing Ward 3. Um, I'm kind of in a dichotomy here because um, uh, smarter people with letters behind their names would tell me that compromise is the best thing to do, but my constituency actually ask, ask me to be a bull in a china shop in most cases. So, of course, I would speak in behalf of option one. And the reason I would support option one is because with lists, as I've found out in my career as a city council person, that you always miss something in your list. And what happens with those lists especially when it comes through the legislature, is it can take up to a year to refine those lists and several discussions, where with me, it can take five weeks. So I'm actually capable of working more at the speed of business. So they may not have even got to build yet, but they can come to me with the idea that this is something they want to do. And if you were to go with option two, all of a sudden I find myself restrained by, you know, saying, like Mr. Moser said, I am the one that looks for loopholes. There is no doubt about it. If I can find a way to get a business into my community through a loophole under the definitions that you've defined, that's exactly what I'm going to do to bring them forth to my community. Because as according to what I read in the Laramie County GOP, we are a free market state. And I believe that this puts uh, severe restrictions on that. And so I definitely would support option one in this case. And I do want to tell my boss thank you for allowing me eight hours of PTO. She asked me not only as a constituent, but also my boss to uh, try to convince you on this, strictly on the fact that she wants more things to do in Cheyenne and really thinks that this is a course of action that we should take. And I am available for any questions. Questions for Councilman Johnson from here in Laramie County, my city council. All right, seeing none. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Other testimony on the bill, Ms. Jones. And then I assume Wham is going to testify at some time on this bill, right? Just making sure you're on deck. Former Senate President, welcome. Mr. Chairman, April Brimmer Coons, Aces Range, but also, as we've had previous conversations, as a private citizen, where I have expressed my opinion about liquor laws, and not necessarily the one that applies to ACES range. Thank you for the privilege of being here. Mr. Co-Chairman, I don't know that I'm dressed for a funeral, but I might be. <laughs> I heard your comment earlier to Mr. Mosher. We became involved, and I'll have my son introduce himself, please. My co-partner. J.B. Coons, uh, representing ACES Range LLC, uh, Mr. Chairman, and members of the uh, Council of Maine. Yes. This came about because of a business concept, an entrepreneurial business concept, and we beg to differ with Mr. Mosier about the popularity of ACES range with golf and shooting simulators. We've had a tremendous response from our community. As a result, there is nowhere that we could turn, as you know, I've mentioned it before, 11 applicants for a full retail liquor license that didn't really fit our need, but it was the only option that we had. All of the club licenses are nonprofits. 
that's good. I mean, it's a positive thing, but there was nothing for us to do but apply. We, along with several other people, obviously didn't receive the license. We said at the last meeting in Casper that we certainly approve of guardrails on the word entertainment. And you've seen a valid attempt here. And we can go through and pick it apart. And there are reasons to pick it apart. It's not good to list a broad variety of categories and then you have no options to, to change it or drop it or whatever, except in the next general session. This is truly an economic development concept to allow entrepreneurs to participate in the liquor laws by having a limited license. If you think about it, in many of your communities, people frequently go to other places to have a choice of entertainment for an evening, or in our case, to improve your golf game, improve your shooting. It's nice to be able to practice shooting and not use all your ammunition. It's expensive and hard to find sometimes. But the point behind this also is keeping young people in the state. As all of you know, I have the incredible opportunity today to sit here before you with all three of my adult children who live in Cheyenne and are in this room. But my point is, is it goes way beyond us. And those of us, the two of us at ACES Range are hoping to help small business. We're not a corporation. We're not a big business who can afford the price of retail liquor licenses here in our community. They're overpriced. But this is an opportunity for the, the small business to come into every one of your towns with their concept of what might keep people in town and provide entertainment for your community. That's the importance of this bill. It's the first time since 1935 that there might, maybe, be a successful attempt to help the small businesses in the small towns and the communities in the state of Wyoming. So that is why we're before you today. And it's obvious the problem with lists. So it would be my hope that you would consider keeping it on the local licensing level, as we discussed in Casper, Senator Scott, because there's no way to really define all of it. And your local community leaders are the ones that know what's needed in the community. And if it doesn't fit, they won't vote for it. And then the people in the community, if they make a mistake and bring something in they shouldn't have, the people in the community have the right to vote and either retain or not retain the people in the local licensing authority. And I think that's the best solution. Mr. Coons, further testimony? I would just like to add uh, that Wyoming is set up as a free uh, economy and we, we need to uh, really take a look at the impact on small businesses trying to start up. Um, young entrepreneurs throughout the state are gonna have a difficult time of procuring a license at the current rate. Um, they're just, it's just not gonna happen. If they want a premise, they're gonna have a premise or they're gonna have a license one or two with without the uh, ability to um, to regulate and kind of, uh, you know, bring this back to um, the local authorities. And 
who need to designate whether or not these uh, entrepreneurs or these business concepts are adequate and um, meet the uh, terms of the, the law. Um, I would like to say as a young person living in Cheyenne now, there's a reason I really don't go out to the older bars. Um, they're just, they've been the same for since I've been here. I mean, it's nothing new, it's nothing entertaining. Um, I'd prefer to go somewhere and actually do something that's not revolved around just purely drinking. Um, and that's kind of what the bars are. It's you go there and um, you sit on a stool and you drink beer and um, it's been done that way for a long time. Um, I think our generation is transitioning into more of uh, having things to do um, and activities that are, you know, uh, crucial, I think, for uh, keeping younger generations in this state and uh, providing jobs um, for the uh, future generations to come. Um, and with that being said, I'm open to any questions that you guys might have for me. Questions for April or JP? Not seeing any right now today. Thank you both for being here. Good seeing you. Other, uh, Mr. Davis has joined us virtually um, here on this topic. Floor is yours, Mr. Davis. Good afternoon, Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Tyler Davis. I live in Jackson. Um, we purchased a movie theater in Jackson last year, and we had a lot of hurdles to get through liquor license. Um, so I don't know all the details like Mr. Mosier and, and all of that, but I definitely support a license that's, that is very specific to entertainment, whether it's live entertainment or movie theaters. Um, our local jurisdiction, for whatever reason, and because of our setup, we don't have the right kitchen equipment. We don't have, we don't qualify for a restaurant license. Uh, so it's it's a big struggle for us to to qualify. And, and with COVID and streaming online, movie theaters are in, in a in a big hurt right now, along with live events. So I fully support um, a license that is unique to entertainment for movie theaters and uh, live events, including obviously with some parameters of size of seating and making sure it's a legitimate establishment. Um, but I am fully in support of some type of license for those theaters. Questions for Mr. Davis? Nothing up to Nebraska? Just because it's in your part of the world? Nope. Okay. Thank you very much, Tyler, for being here with us. Thank you. Other public comments? Wham? You know I want to hear from you, so come on down. Maybe bring the town of Jackson and Cheyenne with you. Um, Mr. Frazier, do you want to start, or you can turn it over immediately, however you'd like to do it. You bet. I'll just uh, briefly say thanks for the record. David Fraser, Executive Director, uh, Wyoming Association of Municipalities. Appreciate the time, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to my left, you see I have Councilman Jorgensen from uh, Jackson and Mayor Collins from Cheyenne with me, and they've got some real world experience to share, but I, I just I guess I just wanted to start off by uh, uh, by saying we appreciate that, uh, that you've spent now two uh, hearings on this topic. Uh, we think it's an important topic, and as I said, in in the last hearing, uh, you know, it's we often we all the time are coming to you asking for tools for economic development. And in this case, again, we're just uh, asking for a tool that will allow us to say yes to opportunities that are coming to our doorstep. Um, and so, uh, I appreciate that you see the importance of that. Uh, we know that uh, we know the definition thing isn't really easy. We're of course comfortable with option one. Uh, but but uh, guessing that you may not be as comfortable with option one, we certainly are willing to work. Uh, and if you are, that's fine. But uh, we certainly are willing to work through uh, the definition as this uh, moves forward. So our ask today would be uh, that uh, you know that we make the headway we can on the definition. If there's still discussion that needs done there, that we uh, you know are at least able to move the bill and continue to work on that definition. Let's throw a question at you, Representative Duncan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to dig in a little deeper on the the definitions, and um, I want to give you the opportunity to counter some of the um, comments about uh, us 
defining versus you at the local level, knowing your municipalities, knowing your communities and knowing what works best for you, creating those definitions and works versus us. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more in detail about that for us and why, um, and, and explain to us why you're the experts at those definitions versus us? Mr. Frazier, go ahead, or you can pass it off if you want. Thank you. Uh, and, and I certainly would welcome my colleagues here to, uh, to ring in as well if they like. And I'm not, I'm not sure that, uh, uh, and again, it was said by previous testimony, that, uh, I guess I would rephrase. I don't, I don't necessarily believe that our uh, mayors and council members are experts at the definitions. I think what they're experts at is their constituents and their communities. And so I think that uh, the idea of allowing them to make those determinations is really just the principle of the folks closest to the people uh, who understand their communities best uh, making those decisions. Follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So as a follow up, would you, would you agree that instead of, of a definition it's more of what is most appropriate type of a business for your license, for a tavern license. What is more appropriate to allow to be licensed um, in your community versus do they check the box? Do they fit into this little narrow um, uh, description? Would that be more accurate? I think that. Uh Thank you, Mr. Chairman, through the chair. Uh, I think that what you would find if, if, if you just delegated this to the, to the local governing bodies, you obviously you would find them wanting to bring some definition to it, at least some criteria that they, on which they'll make those decisions uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, you know, the obvious one, so the public understands if somebody's applying, they understand uh, what the criteria is going to be for making that judgment and just so there's a common understanding among the members of that governing body that uh, what the criteria they'll be looking at. So I think I think if you did something as broad as just delegating it to the local governments, I think you'd see those those uh, principles or, or required findings taking place on the local ordinance level. Uh, again, uh, again, I'm perfectly fine if you wanted to just do that delegation. Um, I've if you guys want to talk about at, you know, at this level, what some of the principles on which they would make those decisions would be. Uh, I don't find that inappropriate either. Uh, what I would worry about would be uh, creating something that, uh, you know, as has been said, that we had to come to the legislature every time there was a new idea we hadn't thought of, or that, or that nobody had thought of, or, or uh, even, or, or just that it would become obsolete. You know, things are put in statute. Sometimes statutes aren't changed for a long time. Uh, I, I think we run the danger in the definition of just creating something that makes sense today, but as time goes on, just becomes obsolete. And uh, so, you know, again, our, our preference always is that those decisions be made closest to the people, but we also understand the legislature's role. And, and uh, uh, so, again, if you wanted to have some of those principles outlined here, I think that would be fine, and frankly, I think that would be a better way to go than try to list every kind of business that we that we can think of might be just to lay out what what uh, what the principles involved in that decision would be. Rep. Duncan. Thank you, and I promise, Mr. Chairman, this is the last one. For Teton County, for example, if we went with option one in this bill, would this allow you to go back to the movie theater and allow them to go ahead and and move forward with this new opportunity for your constituents. Thank you, Chair Rep Rep Representative Duncan. Um, Arne Jorgensen, current Vice Mayor, absolutely. And this is a discussion that we've been having as a community. Um, clearly, as has been said, we would prefer option one. And I think it is, it's a question of appropriate use. I'm very, very cognizant of Mr. Moser's discussion of density of licenses. That's really important, particularly in a community of ours where much of the current calculation is based on year round population and not our visitation. So this gives us a tool to be a little bit more precise in that. Um, very specifically in our community, there's several issues here and I'm, and I'm expanding a little bit on the question here, if that's okay, Chair. Um, the 
For us, it's as much as keeping and preserving businesses as bringing new businesses in. And you heard from the movie theater, that's an existing business that's been around in our community for decades upon decades. And they're facing real market challenges. And we're as a council looking for ways to allow that business to stay and be part of our community. So to us, um, indoor concerts, again, Mr. Moser had some interesting discussions about how you define that, um, movies or films. And I could see similar things playing out with bowling as well as examples of long time businesses or activities that we're risking at the risk of losing. So I very much look at this specifically in that one case, but we also need to be honest with ourselves. This is broader than any one single case, but certainly with the theater would be very appropriate. And while you have the microphone, any other comments? I was break? able to expand what I said into that answer. Thank you, Chair. Um, I believe the mayor may have some other things to add here that might be actually very appropriate in terms of criteria. Great. Mayor Collins. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I'm Mayor Patrick Collins from Cheyenne. And I would like to start by saying I love the idea that this brings to us. Um, but I also appreciate the challenges you guys have with balancing our needs for you know, more licenses and more business opportunities with the, uh, the social problems that come with alcohol. And so what I like about this particular bill is we're not asking for bars where, like Mr. Coons just said, where you sit at a stool and you drink beer or whatever your libation is. Uh, we're, we're talking about an entertainment thing where you're there for a different purpose and alcohol just happens to be something that helps that business to be successful and makes the experience a little bit better. Um, I guess for me, creating fun things to do is a good thing. Um, it's giving us um, uh, our residents and, and that workforce that we're trying to establish uh, a reason to choose to stay in our communities. Um, we're competing for, for that workforce and I think that that's an important thing. Um, we definitely personally like option one. I mean, I think that that's, a, that's an important uh, thing for us. But if we were going to choose a list, one of the things that I think is important is that we make sure that we have a way to deal with that. And so one of the things that, that we have talked about is um, trusting your staff to help you and help us go through this. If there's something that falls through the cracks, what we don't want to have to do is come back and take your time um, to add or subtract one item. And so I would propose that you would allow the, um, the division, the liquor division, to add or delete entertainment activities um, in accordance with the Wyoming Administrative Procedures Act, uh, making the determination regarding an entertainment activity. And you know, they would look at things like the degree to which the activity allows for participants of varying ages and skill levels, whether the, the activity is likely to garner interest by the public as a service, as a viable business model in connection with the issuance of an entertainment license whether and to the degree that the proposed activities currently offered it in general in this state or other states is a paid service. And then going through all those um, considerations and looking at it, allowing your staff to be able to add or subtract. So, you know, if you want to start with a list or, or whatever, I think we can handle it on the local level. We've already started working on some of what our definitions would be should you pass this. Um, but, um, well, we're, we're going to miss something, right? We see it all the time in our local government. Give us a way to make sure we can do that administratively. As Councilman Johnson was saying, instead of having to wait a year or 18 months in order to get something fixed, we could go to uh, Mr. Montoya and through the Administrative Procedures Act, we could correct that uh, in a more timely, more business-like manner. Um, the other thing I think that I heard earlier was just the support of entrepreneurs. Uh, we have a couple of entrepreneurs here, young people who are trying to make investments in our community, and we. We have a systemic problem that doesn't allow us to do that. We have the grain elevator, that I think I shared with you guys before, a hundred year old building that's been empty forever. It's literally demo demolition by neglect right now. It's sitting there and these two doctors and their wives see the vision of this and they want to put something in there. This bill um, might help us do that by creating some sort of entertainment to go with it. Um, JB and his group um, on, on Aces Range, um, they have a vision. You know, I don't know if it's gonna succeed or not, Many businesses don't succeed, but I don't want to say no for them. I want to give them a chance to be successful. And so I think this bill has a chance to do that. And I would urge your, your support and your recommendation on that. Thank you. Committee questions for uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, or WAM in general? Representative Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mayor, if your people have worked on the definitions, 
Did you bring them with you so you might share them with us and help us with this bill or? Mr. Mayor, if you have them. Here's just a couple of things as we were trying to define what an entertainment license would be. Um, entertainment means an activity occurring at a fixed location that is designed to give enjoyment, diversion, or amusement to a person. Entertainment shall not include any activity where the activity participant must be 18 years old or older in order to participate. Um, entertainment shall include the following. Video game bars where monetary consideration persons may play a video game or arcade, including but not limited to games that use electronic or computerized circuitry to take input from the player and trans translate that to an electronic display or games such as pinball, claw machines, skee ball, or other similar, similar entertainment machines and or apparatuses. Games of physical skill that test the strength, agility, or reflexes of a player where the outcome depends in a predictable way on the action of the player with little or no element to chance. I'm thinking bowling. Um, indoor trampoline parks that have multiple trampolines placed together to create a large area for use that may also include foam pits or other elements intended to enhance the experience for park patrons. Theater houses that theater houses and concert halls that host artistic productions offered through various mediums as a live audience, including cinema, live music, comedic performances, academic presentations, or other performances, or any other um, that would promulgate it. Those would at least be our start. So we're working towards trying to understand what it is that the intent of the bill was, and those are some of the things we've started to work on. Okay. Further questions? Seeing none. Thank you, Wim. Other people here to testify on this bill? Going once. Let me check the waiting room just in case. Going twice. Seeing none, we will close public comment. Committee, what, uh, Representative Sweeney, did you want to testify on this one? Yes. <clears throat> yes, I thought I had my hand up when I you got let back that in the room. So, so uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, um i've got uh really just a, a few comments um whatever we do across the board in my opinion should be fair and equitable uh kind of across the state not uh town by town and i think one of the ways we get there is um uh through uh, through through the definitions and whether it's if, if you go with option one uh, that that's fine but there still needs to be some sideboards uh, so that there's some consistency across the state um, you know there's a number of staff comments uh, previous uh, prior to page six uh, but I won't um, delve on those. So if if going to page six, if you did go with option one, uh, in my mind, uh, I, I don't think you can leave it just uh, as, as broad as let the local licensing authority um, take care of it and come up with their own ordinances and their own definitions, um, which is part of the suggestion. I realize Mary Collins has just put forth some great ideas, I think. But I, so what if Casper decides to do it one way, Cheyenne does it another way, and Cody does it a totally different way? Then where are we at? In my opinion, we're back to the Wild West, uh, pre-1935 um, and before Prohibition. So I, I don't think that's the intent, um, but I, I think some of the, the other things, um, there was just announced a uh, youth esports event at some of our theater complexes here in Casper. Um, I think that's an up and coming industry that I think Visit Casper is already exploring as an option um, uh, here in Casper. 
So where does where does that come in? Where does axe throwing? Because frankly, uh, last year that was a hot issue. There's still uh, facilities available here. They wanted to know how they could sell the beer rather than the patrons bringing their own booze in. And Mr. Chairman, it leads me to my last point is if these folks are getting into the liquor business and I don't see it in any of, of these, um, not only should we be concerned about uh, with a normal business, a retail business, you obviously got your, your insurance and glass coverage and inventory coverage and all of that. But in the liquor business and hospitality business, we also have to be concerned about liquor liability insurance, not only the entertainment side, but specifically liquor liability. And so I'm concerned about that. I don't, that may be, Mr. Montoya certainly would know better than I, but if, if the committee decides to move forward with this, um, number one needs to be some sideboards. And I, I believe that you could go with one, but there's got to be some consistency statewide with this so that um, Gillette's not doing something totally different than, than it looks in necessarily Cheyenne. With that, uh, thank you for the time. Thank you, Rick and Sweeney. Any questions, committee? Seeing none, all right, back to public comment. Going once, going twice. We'll close public comment. Committee, what is, Senator Scott? Moving 23 LSO 118 Tavern Entertainment Liquor Licenses, seconded by Duncan. Um, Senator Scott, pick a choice. Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, it seems to me, you know, we're, we're a state that has always prided ourselves on being friendly to free enterprise, friendly to uh, new businesses, people coming up with entrepreneurial ideas and following through on them. And we've got an instance here where we've heard, I can remember at least three different outfits that have found the liquor laws to, to be an obstacle to being able to do the kind of business that they, they've envisioned. Uh, I think we've un uncovered a real need here. Uh, you know, we have the liquor laws because alcohol does do some special things to people and because of the history there uh, coming away from prohibition we we can't take the radical step of just abolishing them and having a free-for-all that i think is not practical but i think we there's a real necessity here to loosen up these laws so these entrepreneurs can move forward and test their ideas in the free market put their money at risk and see if they can make it work so mr chairman i think i think we need the bill with regard to the options my preference Mr. Chairman, would be option one, because I think that does enable the local authorities to respond to what their communities want and to respond to the marketing opportunities that their communities face, which I think are different from one part of the state to the next. So I think option one is, is the better choice, but I'm for the bill no matter what option we elect. So, Mr. Chairman, I will also move that we adopt our option one. Second by another cut. All right, discussion on amendment number one committee, giving it to the local licensing authority, which would mean either the city or county in most cases um, to determine what works best for their jurisdiction. It would be interesting if a city and county had drastically different definitions is my slight concern. Seeing no further discussion, Senator Case. Well, I'm certainly, you know, it's a liquor bill, you know where I'm at. I'm always conflicted on liquor bills, but I don't think this makes sense to me. I, I think uniformity is important. So. Uh, on, the amendment so far? Uh, on whether it should be the free for all mechanism, local government free through all. I, I don't think that's appropriate. Okay. Further discussion? Representative Burt? <laughs> 
I too would be, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, I too would be in favor of number one. Um, and I don't believe uniformity is where we need to go with it either. I can tell you what happens in Sweetwater County is different than what's going to happen in Uinta County, Lincoln County, or any other counties. Population is different. Um, needs of the population are different, like we've heard before. So I don't, I don't see if we try to go uniform again, then we're going to get to the same side of, you know, what works here is going to not work somewhere else. And then we're going to set in statute what a community has to get involved with or what they can't get involved with. <laughs> And we might be tying their hands and then the whole argument of you know trying to let the free market be free is kind of moot so i would push for the number one and then not push a uniform standard of what we have to follow let let the local run local any other discussion what? seeing none question be called all in favor of the amendment please say aye aye let's say no that amendment's going to carry um, committee, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think if one is in there, we don't need to discuss options two, three, or four uh, that LSO has drafted. But if anybody would like to, certainly open that up right now. Seeing none, we didn't really discuss the other new language in the bill. I do have some apprehension that there's not a number of these entertainment licenses necessarily. I mean, I know we don't do that for restaurants, but um, I certainly don't want a municipality or a, a licensing authority to find a creative way to get around the, the matrix formula by saying, oh, you could have an entertainment license, X, Y, Z, and then it, it throws our population formula off. Representative Duncan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Am I on? Am I on? Hello? Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Again, I think, I think it's not necessary because you know, one, these are entertainment facilities, and the majority of it, I believe we decided, wasn't it 60-40? Wasn't that the amount of the threshold? Was that in our bill? 60-40? Uh, okay, people are nodding yes. We've discussed it back and forth so much, sorry. Uh, so the primary business is entertainment. The secondary part is the alcohol so again it's going to go back to since we adopted the option one it's going back to the municipality to decide you know how many of these are going to be you know available distributed whether it works for their community or not one community might be a little bit more restrictive because they are less um entertainment a little more conservative more church going people maybe versus one that's more like tourism more exciting more entertaining i guess more drinking so i it, it just each each community is going to be completely different so i think it's going to dictate its own based on its own community and each community across our state is completely different so i i don't think it's necessary Oh, Mr. Montoya, come on down. I know, I have questions. So here's my concern committee, right? So why do we actually need a bar and grill liquor license any longer if we're going to allow entertainment, which is 60% of food and entertainment combined? There would be no reason, is my question to Mr. Montoya, is there still a separate space for a bar and grill liquor license if we have the bill going forward now that an entertainment license is the same matrix or am i missing um, something thank you mr chairman tom montoya department of Rare liquor division um really that's your call um you know the the barn grill license has a specific person uh purpose out there it's it's worked really well um and you know with the previous bill that's going through it's actually going to be end up if the bill makes it into law uh, will actually eliminate the restaurant license uh, in 2033. Um, so um, this is just a totally different animal that you have to decide, um, does Wyoming need one or not? You can't make your bar and grill, you just say, let's be a tavern and we'll add some skill games or any number of other activities. I'm just a little worried about, but I assume your local licensing authority will allay my fears and not let anything too outrageous happen. Representative Duncan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
what about, is it necessary to include food in the entertainment description of this tavern description? I mean, do you have to have food? I mean, you could put food in and it could be part of your 60%, but your entertainment should be your 60%. Your yeah, your profit sure. should be 60%. Entertainment, do you, I mean, that's how I read it. How, how would you interpret that? Would that help you with your discernment, discernment between the food and bar and grill versus entertainment? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Uh, Representative Duncan, that's really your call. Uh, it wouldn't present any problems for us or even the local licensing authority. Um, it will be one additional line on the application uh, as far as being able to uh, uh, renew the application to review those numbers. Um, you know, both the restaurant does that and the bar and grill does that. It's, it's not a, a big issue for the liquor division during the review. So really, it's just your call if you want to include food with entertainment on this license. Okay, any other discussion or amendments? Seeing none and hearing Representative Roscoe, you have some discussion or an amendment? Uh, yours. Just a little opinion, Mr. Chairman. I can see this uh, appropriate licensing authority being a pretty popular um, position in the future if they're, you know, if you're involved with your local community. And I think, I, and I truly believe that local control is the best thing here. So I'm in favor of option one. Um, I think that communities will, I don't think it'll be the Wild West. I think they will pay attention to who gets a license and who doesn't, and it'll be more uh, locally controlled, and I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Another discussion? Seeing none, and question being called, LSO, if the roll call vote on LSO 118. Mr. Chairman, Senator Boner submitted an absentee vote of aye. Senator Case? Senator Nethercott? Senator Scott? Aye. Representative Blackburn? Representative Burt? Aye. Representative Clausen? Representative Duncan? Representative Ayer? Representative Lebeau? Representative McGuire? Aye. Representative Roscoe? Chairman Driscoll. Chairman Swanitzer. Mr. Chairman, we have eight ayes, two noes, two conflict, one excused. Thank you all for uh, staying with us for the interim on all those alcohol bills. We're going to go up to housing issues next. We need to take 30 mm -hmm. seconds to have the room. Those of you not staying, We'll give you uh, 30 seconds to congregate out. And then we will take up 23-187, uh, the Wyoming Municipal Land Bank Act. Are you presenting that, Mr. Anderson? If you'd come on forward. <clears throat> All right, I think we settled back down. So welcome, Josh, if you'd present 187 to us. Sure thing, Mr. Chairman, uh, Josh Anderson, LSO. This is uh, 23 LSO 187, Wyoming Mun Municipal Land Bank Act. You recall um, this came out of discussions at the August meeting um, where um, uh, the committee was uh, presented the, the Nebraska uh, version of this bill. Um, I would note, you know, just kind of briefly, you know, as I got into the Nebraska law, I, I would have maybe called that unpolished to some degree. Um, so you'll see a, a few staff comments throughout highlighting some of the things we noted. Um, so just the overall intent of the bill, Mr. Chairman, is um, it would allow uh, municipalities to create these land banks. Um, that would acquire real property that is um, either abandoned or tax delinquent and uh, return that property to productive use so that it returns to the tax rolls. Um, and you'll see it, it's somewhat similar to some of our existing laws. There's uh, the Urban Renewal Code, which can be found in 15.9.101. 
and this is in, included in that same chapter. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, this is a fairly long bill. I'll kind of hit the highlights and and please uh, stop me if you have any questions. Um, first, just a short title and legislative findings. Um, and I would note just on page three, that last legislative finding is kind of what I noted that the, the establishment of land banks is to provide for the return of vacant land, vacant abandoned and tax delinquent properties to productive use. And that constitutes a valid public purpose and benefit to the citizens. You'll see there their definitions. Um, over to page five, this is where land banks can be created. Um, there's kind of three different ways these can be formed. And you'll note there, subsection A, uh, currently as drafted, it's um, a first class city by itself can form a land bank. Um, just a note here, so Nebraska's law was limited to uh, metropolitan class and primary class cities. So those would be cities, um, their metropolitan class is uh, population over 400,000 or primary class is 100,000 to, to 400,000. Um, so our first class cities are, are 4,000. So if you wanted to, to limit this by population, that might be something to consider, um, but we didn't have a further um, classification of cities like Nebraska did. So that first one is a single city, then uh, subsection B, if you're smaller than that, you could form it jointly with one or more additional municipalities. Subsection C, um, any other municipality can join I mean, uh, a land bank that's formed under subsection A or B. <clears throat> uh, subsection D just uh, creates that or notes that the land bank is a body politic and corporate uh, operating as a municipality an instrumentality of the municipality or munis municipalities that created the land bank. And again, there then subsection E, the primary objective is to facilitate the return of vacant, abandoned, and tax delinquent properties to productive use. Uh, the next section is uh, saying who is on the land bank board. Subsection A, again, is, is the one formed by a single city. And you can see some of the requirements requirements there. I would note um, that it does require it be confirmed by two-thirds vote of the municipality's governing body. We just noted, um, didn't really know why that would be a supermajority instead of just a majority vote, but just wanted to highlight that for the committee. Um, and you can see there uh, the requirements for the members that can sit on that board. I'm not going to go through all those, but please let me know if you have any questions. Over to subsection uh, B on page 10, um, this is the requirements for a board if it's uh, created by more than one municipality. And again, would note there on uh, midway down the page that that also requires a two third vote of the uh, governing body of each municipality that created the land bank. As we go. Mr. Chairman, my question is, uh, in my area, I suspect that there are needs that are in the urban area, but are outside the boundaries of one of the cities. Uh, is it possible for a uh, city county joint powers board? To, to be a land bank under this because uh, I can see I can see there might be some real value and that might be a way some of our smaller municipalities could could participate and some of our problems are in some of our smaller municipalities um, so, so that's my question it, would a joint powers board be eligible under this language or would you have to modify the language mr. chairman uh the way this is drafted, it would just be uh, municipalities and, and the land banks actually prohibited from acquiring any property that's outside of the, of the city limits. So the way, and again, that was based on the Nebraska law. So if you wanted to have it uh, be expanded into counties that would need to be revised. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
I think on page five, paragraph or line 15 through 20 does allow two or more municipalities to form a joint powers board to create a land bank. And then it also then on in the next paragraph allows for a municipality to join an existing land bank that's formed under a joint powers board. So I think to answer Senator Scott's question, the answer is in essence, yes. But could a current joint powers board become a land bank? No, they would need to, yeah, become a joint powers board. My concern is that there are some, some very much urban properties um, in the in the county area, but in the part of the county area that's essentially uh, urban developed, that where there are problems and, and having the county able to participate would be worthwhile, but we'd have to do extensive modification then uh, because of the prohibition of doing things outside the municipal boundaries. And you would need to exempt ag land and frankly vacant land in the rural areas uh, that from from being subject to this. So I'm that would be more of a of an amendment than I think I, we could undertake right here. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe somebody could. But, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I see a potential need there. Sure thing, Mr. Chairman, and I will note when I, when we get to that point where where it limits the where the property can be located. <clears throat> uh, continuing on, Mr. Chairman, um, on to page thirteen, uh, continuing with uh, the the board of the bank and sub subsection C. These are the provisions that apply to either type of board. Um, where they uh, subsection C was the selection of officers. Subsection D allows them to, um, uh, or allows public employees to part be members of the board. Subsection E is related to vacancies on the board. Subsection F, compensation. Subsection G, and most of the next couple pages um, deals with the removal of a person from the board. Over to page 15, subsection K. Um, these are the requirements for meetings and also what constitutes a quorum. Page 16, subsection M, most of the business being done um, by the land bank would need a, a majority of a quorum, but there are a few things that would require more than that. So subsection N are those um, actions that would take a majority of all uh, voting members of the board. That includes adoption of bylaws, hiring or firing of an employee, the incurring of debt, the adoption of the annual budget, and uh, the sale or lease of uh, property of more than $50,000. Subsection O says uh, members shall not be liable on bonds. Um, subsection P, this requires a two thirds vote for um, what is called an automatically accepted bid. We'll get to that. Um, a little later, Mr. Chairman, um, but that would uh, adopting policies related to the what would qualify for an automatically accepted bid would require a two thirds vote of the land bank on the 18. Um, these are things that would be required to be adopted into policies uh, for those um, automatic bids. And um, and then over to page 19, again, it would note that um, it would need to be uh, determined by a two thirds vote of the voting members of the board whether to do a an automatic bid. Page 19, um, or bottom of page 19, these are the agents and employees of the land bank, just uh, gives them power to uh, have their own employees. Page 20, the powers of the land bank can adopt, amend, repeal bylaws. Uh, paragraph two, borrow money from private lenders. Um, you'll see there in the staff comment, um, it, it often appears throughout the Nebraska law that it's intended, land bank's intended to be um, an independent corporation from the municipality, but 
it's not always clear if it's it's totally an independent entity. Um, if the land bank is not an independent entity, um, it would be subject to the debt limitations specified by the Constitution, Article uh, 16, Sections 4 and 5. Um, it all, this also gives land banks the power to initiate issue a negotiable negotiable revenue bonds. So let me stop you real fast. Yes, sir. Do, would we need a, a separate stanza in our law then to specify that it is in fact independent from municipality then? I, th I think that would be great, Mr. Chairman. And there's maybe a couple spots where we might need to to separate how much control the municipality has over um, this corporation uh, in some spots. Um, those would be some of the, the issues we'd want to look at if you wanted to make clear that that this was an it was an independent uh, entity not controlled by the municipality. Oh, um, Mr. Chairman, and um, again, it, uh, subsection three allows them to, or, or paragraph three allows them to issue negotiable revenue bonds. Just would a note there that the Nebraska Land Bank Act originally allowed those. Um, but those were uh, essentially repealed effective November 14th, 2020. Uh, so if the committee can consider whether they want them to have the power to issue bonds or not. Again, additional powers of uh, pre procuring insurance, entering into contracts, um, providing foreclosure prevention, counseling and rehousing assistance, investing the money of the land bank. And again, another staff comment over on page 23. Um, that if it's not an independent entity, it would be subject to investment limitations of the Constitution, Article 16, Section 6. Um, and again, you can see additional powers there, um, design, develop, real property, um, fix, charge, and collect fees and charges for services, collect rents and leasehold payments, uh, grant easements, And then it gives some prohibitions there, bottom of page 24, Mr. Chairman, uh, land bank shall not uh, possess or exercise the power of eminent domain, shall not levy property taxes or receive property taxes except as provided later in this act. Uh, section 308 on page 25, uh, requirements for the acquisition of property, just authorizes land bank to acquire property um, in the manner it considers proper. proper. Uh, does require the land bank to maintain its real property in accordance with the laws of the jurisdiction, um, provided that if it acquires property that is outside of compliance, it shall be required to be brought into compliance within a reasonable time. <clears throat> Again, here is where we I discussed earlier, subsection C, land bank shall not own or hold real property located outside the jurisdictional boundaries of the municipality or mis municipalities that created the land bank. Um, shall not include any lands owned, leased, or controlled by a municipality that are outside the municipal limits. Um, here's a requirement of how much land the bank can hold, uh, not more than 7% of the total number of parcels in a municipality, and no more than 10% of that uh, can, shall be zoned as commercial property. Um, and just the note there that Nebraska had a much wider variance in the their types of, of city classifications. Uh, so those amounts ranged for the different classes of cities from 3% to 10% of the total parcels and either five or 10% of the, those parcels being uh, commercial. Also requires that um, the land bank not acquire a, a commercial property unless it has been vacant for uh, at least three years. Subsection or section 309 uh, just provides that the property held by a land bank is exempt from taxation. Um, requires the land bank to hold property in its own name. Requires the land bank to uh, maintain an inventory of all real property held by the land bank and makes that subject to a public records act. Um, Subsection C uh, just allows the land bank to uh, determine what type of consideration it would take for um, transfer of real property. Um, subsection D allows the land bank to convey property. Um, it also 
limits the ability of the land bank to lease property for a period not to exceed 12 months. And um, although that if it acquires property that has a, a, a lease that is longer than that, then the 12 month limitation would not apply. Um, here in subsection E, it requires a land bank to follow priorities established by a municipality and then authorizes the municipality to uh, establish those uh, ranking of priorities um, and a list of examples of what that might include at the bottom of page 29 over to page 30. Subsection F um, allows the municipality to um, require potentially require certain voting approval requirements for the disposition of property. And again, that might be something that might uh, be seen to make this more of an arm of the municipality instead of a uh, separate entity. Section 311, bottom of page 30, this is land bank funding. It allows land bank to receive funding essentially from any source and uh, to uh, retain payments for services rendered. Uh, subsection C is a, a tax sharing provision, essentially when the property is transferred back from the land bank to private hands, that then for the next five years, uh, the tax that the city would get from that property, 50% of that uh, would go uh, to the land bank for their, for their funding source. Subsection D uh, just allows the land bank to um, not receive that uh, tax share. Uh, section 312, this is, are the bonding provisions. Um, these are fairly uh, consistent with other bonding provisions uh, in our statutes um, with a note again that as of uh, November 14, 2020, the Nebraska Land Bank Act uh, does not allow any further bonds. <clears throat> uh, section 313 on page 34, these are uh, just makes their meetings subject to the public records and their records, their public meetings act and their records subject to the public records act. Requires monthly reports to the municipality as well as an annual report to the municipality and to this committee. Subsection D just uh, specifies what needs to be included in that report. Section 314 on page 36 deals with the dissolution of a land bank um, and just provides that that is required to be again by two thirds vote of the governing body of the municipality. Um, if it's for multiple municipalities, it just requires a majority vote of each uh, municipality. Section 315, um, just conflicts of interest. This um, prohibits the land bank from acquiring interests in property um, or conveying property to a member of the board or employee or their family. And same thing with uh, contracts for services and materials. Um, section 316, Mr. Chairman, uh, over on page 38, um, you'll see a staff comment there. It, it was unclear reading the Nebraska law, but it appeared that they gave the land banks the, the ability to, to essentially say that all property taxes on property they acquired had been forgiven. And there's not really a, a, a way to do that under Wyoming law. The way it's drafted in the bill just basically says that they can agree with the transfer of the property on any share of who is required to pay that tax. You'll see in the staff comment, the alternative language would be essentially allow them uh, land bank to acquire property and then defer the taxes until uh, they transfer the property. Um, section 317, dealing with tax sales. Again here, this uh, um, the first is just that they would be able to bid on a tax sale similar to any other private party. Um, but then subsection or paragraph two on page 41, um, if approved by two thirds vote, they could give an automatically accepted bid, um, which would essentially mean that they would ignore all other bids and allow the, the land bank to purchase the property. Um, just a note there that this was, again was 
limited to uh, a metropolitan class city, which was only Omaha. Um, so again, here included for uh, committee discussion. Um, and again, then similar on page 42 for foreclosure sales. Again, this also allows them to provide an, a, a bid as a normal bidder or to do an automatically accepted bid. Um, here, it was interesting that they needed written consent, um, but in, written consent would be uh, assumed if they didn't get a response within 30 days from the foreclosing party. Again, that. Uh, and you have an amendment ready to take all that out, should we want to? <laughs> I think uh, it would be very easy just to delete that uh, paragraph, Mr. Chairman. Great. And then um, subsection C there, um, if there's no bid on a, on a property at a foreclosure sale, the land bank is deemed to have bid the total amount of taxes, interest, and costs, and that bid sh is required to be accepted by the sheriff. Um, and if it would result in the land bank holding exceeding the total number of parcels that it's allowed to hold, that would um, would not be subject to that limitation. And just a staff note there that it would potentially require the land bank to purchase multiple properties that it did not bid on, and that may not be consistent with the purposes of the land bank. Um, also, no apparent requirement that the land bank have the ability to pay for that property. Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Josh, I'm, I'm trying to understand this a little bit. So if you're having a sheriff sale and uh, uh, or for a, any type of foreclosure within the court, who is the board that we're talking about? The, the land grant the land board? Bank board. And so they can do kind of a sealed bid on that, but is the foreclosing entity required to accept it? Um, Mr. Chairman, if it was, I guess, in two cases, it seems that way. So under the automatically accepted bid, uh -huh. as long as they had uh, written consent or were deemed to have written consent because the foreclosing party did not respond within 30 days, then they would automatically uh, get be deemed to have bid and be the winning bidder. Or under subsection C, if there's no other, if there's no bid equal to the amount of taxes, interest, and costs, um, then the land bank is just deemed to have made a bid equal to that amount. And uh, Mr. Chairman, can I explore this a little bit? In the case of the former, um, where there's sort of an agreement between the foreclosing entity and the land bank, I guess, to put in this bid um, that would be accepted mm -hmm. um, there are other interests out there i mean sometimes there are other debt holders that aren't the foreclosing entity they have a subsequent interest in the property they're hopeful they're likely to come in and bid even higher they you know they would there so there could be higher bids and this seems to say you the higher bids don't matter is what that's saying and it that seems pretty anti-capitalist <laughs> free market and it, and it hurts the interest of these other people who have, may have a second lien or whatever on the property they're 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 out completely is what i hear is that would and, you agree with mr anderson mr chairman yeah I, I think it raises those concerns and that's the reason i was highlighting this for further committee discussion Go ahead for now and we'll finish up the bill draft and then start uh, cutting it down. Sure thing, Mr. Chairman. Um, so then the rest of the bill, um, just uh, amendments to existing law. You'll see that on page 47 um, that real property owned by a land bank is, is made exempt from property taxes. There's another, if you wanted to do a deferral um, of property taxes, then that would be that staff comment there, bottom of page 47. And um, and the rest of the other changes are just conforming changes, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Questions committee. You know, Nebraska seems to have a very interesting process when it comes to lien sales and tax auctions. It probably would not fit into Wyoming's law very agreeably. So when we, if we get to that point, we might rip that part out. 
Go ahead, Senator Case. Well, kind of a general question. I don't think it was really addressed. If if a property, uh, someone hasn't paid their taxes, the, the way it works in Wyoming is, is the um, county uh, treasurer holds a kind of a, a proceeding whereby people can come in and pay the taxes on behalf of the deal. And then it takes, you have to hold the property for like three years, you have to pay the back taxes and you pay current taxes. And then eventually, and it's a very long tortured process with lots of notice, you can eventually get title to the property if you just hang in there. But during the whole time that this proceeds, the person that actually owns the property can redeem it by paying up all the fees and there's quite a hefty amount of interest. Um, does this affect that at all? Have anything to do with properties that maybe, uh, they don't lead to a sheriff sale for, for se because it's not a foreclosure, but it is also a process where these distressed properties transfer to other owners. Does this impact that at all? Mr. Chairman, I think that's what's attempted to be done in, in uh, section 317, so page 40, 41, so essentially subsection B there, if they if the bank's bid is accepted, land bank shall pay the county kind of treasurer and shall be entitled to a tax sale certificate. So kind of would just be as if they were any other uh, bidder on that type of sale, Mr. Chairman. Is that a case? What well, does this cut out the the period of time that the actual property owner has to redeem the property, which actually works out to be several years in, in the in in a, in effect four to six from what i understand yeah. remember i don't believe so mr chairman i think it would yeah be. okay other questions for josh on the bill and did we look at any other i know we asked specifically to copy the nebraska statute but did we look through what the 25 or so other states do in regards to how they structure theirs Mr. Chairman, I had not looked at other states. I'd be happy to do that if you'd like. Dr. Clausen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Josh, so was there an explanation for this bill? Because I think Nebraska has the opposite problem that we do. So the backstory behind why they did it. So, you know, so Nebraska has a whole bunch of small towns with houses that nobody will buy. You can get free lots. Nobody's living there. The towns conglomerate. And then you have these these towns that are basically abandoned. There's whole towns that are abandoned in Nebraska. I think they're trying to solve the opposite problem with this bill. Was there like a back explanation or? Uh, the, there are people I think who are gonna testify regarding where it came. I mean, at our previous meeting, they testified that other states do this and that's why we brought the motion and asked Ellis to draft it up. So you'll hear from them in a second. Any other questions for Josh? Seeing none, thank you. People here to testify on the bill. Come on down. County Commissioners Association is going to make it first. And then Ms. Burke will have you next. Welcome, Mr. Riemann. A slightly surprised you didn't want to jump in on local licensing for alcohol laws, but you sat there patiently and quietly, so I didn't call on you. But welcome up on this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Jeremiah Riemann here on behalf of the County Commissioners Association. Uh, we don't have a position on this bill uh, necessarily, but did want to make a comment on a couple of things. Senator Scott pointed out one of those things is uh, whether you want to include counties as one of the eligible entities to participate in this. I think he brings up a good point that you could incentivize development outside of the municipal boundaries if you're not careful about what the parameters are around that. But uh, let's be honest, there are a couple of counties in this state where it's perhaps likely uh, and maybe uh, even beneficial that they would be involved in this sort of an arrangement. Uh, Teton County comes to mind uh, immediately, but Sheridan County has been working on this particular issue and, and they might be interested. Um, looking beyond that particular issue, uh, there's just one other uh, issue that comes up in the legislation that I, I would suggest, regardless of what you do about including counties uh, in this, that perhaps you uh, take some look at, and that's on page 20. And then it comes up again on uh, page 30 and of page 31. Uh, and that revolves around whether or who's allowed to be involved with 
uh, uh, grants or loans uh, as part of these partnerships. Uh, it states in there uh, that it can come from the private sector, it can come from the municipalities, it can come from the state or the federal government, but it says nothing about counties. Uh, and so perhaps you would want to include counties as one of those eligible entities that could provide some financing for these particular activities. Uh, and with that, Mr. Chairman, I would stand for any questions. Questions, the County Commissioner's Association. I would imagine we do have some unincorporated areas of the counties that have, um, I wouldn't call them towns, but have areas that could come under uh, some of these statutes and there may be a necessity or uh, a want to extend it. So keep that in mind, committee, we go for it. And there is no issue from the association whether or not we add them. Is that what I heard? You don't have, you, you want to be included, you don't want to be included. Mr. Chairman, it, it seems to me that it would be best if we were uh, an eligible entity, but uh, as I was contemplating that, I, I, I think you do have to be careful about incentivizing development in the unincorporated areas of the county, and I think that's where Senator Scott was getting into some uh, concepts to consider around excluded lands from that particular arrangement. Uh, so, but, but yes, I would lean towards counties being included. Senator Scott. Some of my concern was that you would get the counties, uh, th that if the counties could do it, uh, we'd get into issues where there was an attack on, on lands that were being held for agricultural purposes or other uh, purposes in the vicinity of the counties, and the counties wanted to develop those and the owners did not. Uh, and I think we'd have to do some pretty careful exemptions to, to include the counties in this. And restricting it to the cities avoids the ag problem pretty well. Other questions, the county commissioners? Seeing none, thanks Jim. Ms. Burkle. And Mr. Bush. Welcome back to corporations. Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, Brenda Burkle, Executive Director from My Front Door, and I have with me Dan Dorsch from Habitat for Humanity of Laramie County. Thank you um, to the LSO, to the committee, and to all those involved with dra uh, the draft. I think that the Nebraska model is a great jumping off point, and probably 90% of the way there with what would be appropriate for Wyoming. Um, I do have a couple of points. Some are small, some are large. Uh, would you uh, prefer that I address all in total here or some of the smaller ones offline and just the big ones here? I'd say the major ones and if the bill moves forward, it gives us a couple months to think about um, you know, if there are other state acts we should be looking at and other smaller amendments for session. So big ones today. Perfect. Um, Mr. Chairman, through you, Senator Scott, um, I appreciate very much um, the inclusion of the county, and that was at the top of my list as well. I think that it bodes well for a good partnership um, between a land bank and city county, all of the entities, entities involved, I think they should be listed. Um, I'm not sure a joint appropriation, appropriations committee is the appropriate place to house that. Typically, um, land banks, um, because they have the ability to sue and be sued present a, a certain amount of risk that um, entities like that tend to shy away from with nonprofits or other entities taking that lead and being appropriately insured to make sure they're not at risk. Um, so the LSO's question about whether this is made to be an independent corporation, that was the intent bringing that forward as a solution here to this committee. Uh, and I agree with the LSO as well in, in kind of separating that out a little bit further. With that being said, um, I would remove the ability of bonding power from land banks, um, being that we have a, state house, a statewide housing finance authority with WCDA, it would be um, efficient to have them partner with land banks um, to work together on that, that end. They have the knowledge, skill, ability experience and expertise to carry that that out for sure. Um, 
I wouldn't worry. I would remove the classes of the cities um, that that Nebraska has set up in theirs. Um, I also want to point out, um, Chairman Zwanitzer, through you to Senator Case, that um, I also have concerns and want to make sure that that those tax delinquent properties and the way that those might find their way to a land bank are appropriately carried out. But also to be clear that tax foreclosure and delinquency is not the only way that properties come into a land bank. They're just the only ones that, that had to be addressed and outlined here. But certainly donations through, say for example, estate planners um, those are also ways that they can come to a land bank. Um, banks that have low, pro low value properties, instead of going through the uh, process, may go ahead and decide to donate that um, to help bolster their CRA scores. Uh, and they can come into a land bank that way as well. So there is more than one way that a land bank does acquire property, um, not the least of which is purchase. Um, so certainly, I would support retooling that that automatic uh, bid and making sure that property private property rights are protected. Um, the other few little large bits that I would um, consider is. Uh, that it seems to me some of the green spaces and public spaces was identified as use of the land bank under the Nebraska model. However, it seems that most of those would be owned already by the municipality and would by definition be tax exempt. So there wouldn't necessarily be another benefit to put those on a land bank um, unless I'm not seeing that benefit. Um, also, I would remove the last on page 30, the last um, use that says other determined by the municipality and or county because we would like to add them. Um, I think that could pose the, the, um, the risk of losing focus on the very, very specific uses. Um, I would recommend removing that. Say that one more time, just so I have it on the bottom of page 30. Um, so the recommended um, uses on the very last bullet point was um, and any other determined by the municipality. I'm not sure that I would leave that so vague. Okay. Um, the other piece is really, um, and I know we don't have a mechanism for it, but being able to extinguish tax liens is a huge piece of what makes that tool on, on the top of holding them tax exempt for the 12 months and being able to extinguish tax liens and clear title and get them into the hands of um, other nonprofits. And that would be the intent of this land bank. Uh, if it were un under one nonprofit, they would then be able to work with all nonprofits along the whole housing continuum. They could also sell it to for profit developers in return for any of, the, any of the uses specified. So low to moderate income housing, that kind of thing. Um, it does talk a little bit about um, being able to use it for um, commercial activity, commercial and industrial activities. Um, I would think that, th that this committee um, might want to weigh that against what's already provided under the Wyoming Business Council for some of those business incentive programs. Um, but I really see this as uh, one tool that is um, focused on vacant, abandoned, or distressed properties, not necessarily vacant, abandoned, and tax delinquent, but vacant, abandoned, and distressed is the nomenclature it pretty much accepted. Uh, and I think this can be a tool for addressing blight and allowing um, nonprofit developers to be able to provide low to moderate income, income housing. At the same time, they're not increasing the lane miles for cities or counties to maintain and they're not adding additional service areas for safety and, and emergency response. 
I would certainly um, defer to my colleague, uh, Dan, to add anything he might like to, and then we would both stand for questions. Thank you. Mr. Dorsch, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Thank you for allowing me to speak to you this afternoon on the land banks. Um, I, I, I just want to lend my support to uh, Mrs. Burkle's comments and, and echo her sentiments as well, so I won't uh, add anything to that. But what I would like to do is give you some real examples of what pro kind of properties the land banks is looking at. And I'll give you three examples specifically here in Cheyenne. So if there's, um, as, as those residents of Cheyenne know, the West Edge project has been talked about for several years now uh, as a revitalization project. Habitat currently has a grant from the CDBG to rehab a residential property and turn it into affordable housing. We've had a hard time doing that. The reason I bring that up is because in that we've been searching blighted and abandoned properties to try to track down the owners to purchase. Three properties that we have looked at are all in the West Edge, which could help that revitalization get underway and be an important part of that. But one of them on 19th Street, um, when you look at the county title, is um, two people, uh, male and female, and when you do a little research, it's a deceased mother and her son. And the property has been tax delinquent for the last five or six years and is just sitting there deteriorating. Another one on 21st has been has a title transferred since 1994. It's boarded up and blighted and is just sitting there. It's actually two homes and a lot of outbuildings that could be utilized for affordable housing. Um, three individuals are listed on the title, two, two males with the same name, one female with a different name, so I assume maybe brothers and sisters, but they all live in Las Vegas. Letters have been sent on our behalf to them with no response. And lastly, one on Snyder, similar to the other one, boarded up. Um, father and son listed as, as the title Black Hawk, Colorado mailing address. Letters have been sent with no response. These are the type of properties that the land banks could utilize. Um, and a land bank could also have more resources and more capacities than one organization like Habitat for Humanity does. It's a small part of our job to look for that, that property, but it's not our sole duty, where a land bank's sole duty is to look for those blighted, distressed, abandoned properties and return them to the market as affordable housing, which as a committee looking at workforce housing is a tool that could be used for that purpose. Thank you. Senator Case, go ahead. Um, oh, with trepidation, I guess, Mr. Chairman, but um, I th the system has a way of working now where people don't pay their taxes eventually, someone pays the taxes, uh, the property eventually transfers. It takes a long time, but it takes a long time because of due process that we decided to give the property owner a chance to get the property back. And during that time, it can look terrible, it can be boarded up, um, and maybe they don't want the property. Um, and so I, I'm really hesitant to like put other priorities in front of the system we have now with respect to tax delinquent properties. But, but I do think there's a market approach that works because someone could come in, contact the existing loaner who hasn't paid their taxes and say, look, you haven't paid your taxes. I'll pay your taxes and give you so much for the property. And uh, whether that works or doesn't work, these property owners may be hard to find. Um, and I think that's true in a lot of these uh, uh, delinquent tax uh, auctions that the assessors have, they just can't find the properties they've gone. It's much the same as the unclaimed property discussion we had earlier. But um, I, I, I'm not really convinced that we need to throw out a system that's working or, and give priority or special privileges to any other player in that. I'm having trouble getting there. It wasn't necessarily a question for you, I don't believe. <laughs> well, uh, but have you had those? I mean, those are concerns. Do you have response to? Mr. Chairman, through you, uh, Senator Case, I, I hear your concerns. And as a fourth generation Wyomingite who values property rights, I get it. Uh, and I don't think, again, I would just reiterate that um, I would I was he would hesitate to throw the baby out with the bathwater here. and retooling some of those uh the language were again i believe 90 percent there on what fits for for wyoming borrowing from nebraska is a great jumping off point and i wouldn't have any problem retooling that tax lane or tax delinquency sale and it is not the only the only method by which those properties come to the land bank um, but 
the fact is, is that um, this land bank may be more appropriate in some areas and less appropriate in others. Um, I also think that there are not, en not enough blighted properties um, in any one municipality in the state that that, that is going to be um, uh, the difference in funding a land bank and not funding a land bank. I, I don't believe that to be true. I also don't believe that by having the land bank and, and handling those properties that way that it's going to affect the market in any way because even if you had a dozen properties in uh, the capital city, because that's where I'm from, um, if you have those in a land bank, any one of those dozen properties isn't going to hit the market all at the same time. They're going to be developed and cleaned up and maintained and get them ready for redevelopment over a staged period of time. Um, so I just think that tax sales has to be defined somewhere if that's a mechanism to get properties into the land bank, but other mechanisms are not defined here because donations don't need to be. Okay. Uh, Senator Scott, question? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> general a question that, that I've had with these, that I think you may be, able to, may be able to answer. We're the, Mr. Chairman, we're the smallest state in the union, less population, uh as and i speak in population terms we don't have a big city with all its problems do we have enough volume of business uh in this state to make one of these land banks a viable institution uh what's been nebraska's experience have been, they been able to use it in the rural areas outside of the omaha area and and, and lincoln and their big bigger cities um, or can I guess I'm really coming out of can we make one of these things work here in Wyoming because we we just aren't big enough. Brenda, good. Uh, Chairman Zwanitzer, through you, Senator Scott. I so I don't think it's really a question of volume. Really, what precipitated this looking at this solution is that. This is kind of a solution that uh, that looks at the one off and the smaller development, the the revitalizing and get getting back into highest best use. This is not a volume tool. It doesn't require a volume market. This is really about addressing blight. Um, and in looking at what we as an organization do as a nonprofit developer, what we ran up against is in Laramie County, we were facing land properties at eighty-five dollars to $150,000 per lot for new construction, which on the back end doesn't make it math out for low to moderate income housing. It just, it, it's just very, very tough. But if we can get that, that land at a much lower cost, even if we have to uh, get a brownfields grant to remove the brownfields, even if we have to do this or that or the other thing, we can still make it math out. And so this is really much more of a small tool um, that that helps that redevelopment piece this isn't a volume tool but the good news is is it's also not a, a tool that requires state investment only enabling legislation mr chairman yeah i hear that you're saying it's not a volume tool but it strikes me if you have a separate institution there's a certain volume needed to pay the overhead on this institution, and I wonder if we're going to be able to get enough volume to, to do that, or if any land bank we create isn't going to simply go broke <coughs> because it can't get enough volume to, to pay its basic bills. Uh, Chairman's wanted to through you, Senator Scott. I, so most of the land banks um, a vast majority look at nonprofits um, as their their land bank tool, uh, and there are many of them who actually um, use the land bank to feed and support a community land trust for affordable housing, um, and those are in the state. Um, we have one in Jackson, one in Cheyenne, and I believe one in Sheridan that is getting up and going. So. I think there are tools and mechanisms um, that make it 
financially feasible and viable, most nonprofits operate on grant funding. Okay, for the questions while they're up here. Not seeing any right now. Don't go too far though. Other people wish to testify for or against this bill. Ms. Urbekite. On behalf of horse racing, huh? Nicotine? Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Lori Urbekite now representing the Wyoming Realtors. Um, we certainly appreciate the effort of a land bank. We like the concept of it. I have a lot of problems with this bill. Um, and to, in respect of your time, um, I will not go through line by line, page by page, but I will tell you that um, on page nine, um, line 11, you have a person must be a realtor to be on that board. Realtor is a trademarked private association, professional association. It is, it, if you want that type of a person on this board, which I'll get into that, um, it should be a real estate licensee, not a realtor. That has no place in statute, sorry. Um, and the, but, but the bigger picture is um, we're pretty definite on who has to be on this board. And I, I would, I just don't think that's a good idea. We're talking first class municipalities of 4,000 people or more. So if it's 4,000 or 4,500, you have to have someone with real estate development expert or real estate development experience. You have to have a real estate licensee. You have to have someone that has done a large scale residential or commercial property rental. I think we're being far too picky about who can be on this, especially if it was for a small community. I would certainly encourage them, the municipalities to seek out people with experience, but I don't think it's needed in this statute for you to define it that closely. Um, trust your municipalities to do the right thing. Um, and then my next big heartache comes on page, I think it was 17. And that is the, yes, page 17, an automatically accepted bid. Yeah, I just, I have a real hard time with that. Um, I know of individuals that um, buy property at the tax sales and they indeed do continue to pay the taxes every year. The term is four years. Um, and, and if the property owner wants to redeem the property before that four years is up, they pay 15% interest and a 3% penalty. So it is a good investment for a lot of private individuals. I, I know in Fremont County, there was one individual that that was like his business. Um, and so um, this automatically accepted bid is just automatically not acceptable to me. I think we're in, interfering with private private business, private enterprise, um, and, and that, I, that just threw me for a loop, especially because I can't find where it's actually defined. You have to have two thirds vote of the board to have an automatically accepted bid, but where does someone tell the treasurer you have to accept that bid? So I have, I have real problems with that part. Um, I question um, when it talked, I had questions about not being able to um, take land in that's outside of the municipality. So what if you have two smaller municipalities that are only eight miles apart, i.e. Grable and Basin, I think, um, why wouldn't they be allowed to utilize some of that property in between the two, two cities? I mean, I, I, I don't understand that prohibition and I don't think it's necessary. I have, a, I, I have questions, oh, Here's one of them I really liked. Page 24, line 11. Do all other things necessary or convenient to achieve the objectives? Convenient terrifies me. So, um, but, but then I have questions about the commercial land. So they can't acquire any commercial property that's not been vacant for three years. There's some great commercial properties that could be um, revitalized for, for workforce housing, for any kind of housing, why that prohibition? I don't understand that. And I don't understand the limit on the percentage of commercial property that they can own. I think this, is, this bill needs a lot, a lot of work. Um, and I don't wanna take all your time going page by page, but um, I would urge you to um, continue working on the concept, yes, um, but, I, but page after page in this bill needs some amendments, a lot of them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You didn't come up, come in with any amendments for us? Mr. Chairman, 
I pondered it, and then I decided no. That but if this bill moves forward, or oh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I'll have pages. Okay. The concept itself. The concept though, is I, I like the concept. I do. I just think that utilizing the Nebraska model, we need to just rework it so it's Wyoming. And you and the realtors would not. commit to at least examining and finding. Mr. Chairman, we'd be happy to. Okay. Appreciate mm -hmm. that. Question to the realtors. Mr. Senator Scott. Mr. Chairman, if this committee were to happen to ask the realtors to work up a, uh, a working draft in this area, would that be something that y'all would be interested in doing? Mr. Chairman, um, you tell me what my timeline is, but certainly, I'm um, yeah. Certainly, and we could take this outline and go through it and try to rework it. So, it, I mean, it's going to take some time, but certainly we we would work along that. Mr. Chairman, just just thinking aloud, I see some need or some value in a bill like this because we do have a problem in a number of our municipalities with just abandoned properties. Um, the realtors are pretty skilled in dealing with these property issues and pretty sensitive to the protection of, of private ownership interests and that sort of thing. If they're willing to, to undertake making a pass that of getting us a workable draft, Mr. Chairman, that might well be something we should take them up on because I don't think this bill as it sits before us is ready for prime time, but I'm not quite ready to give up on it yet either. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, that's a, that'd be an option going forward, I think. Another cut? Mr. Chairman, thank you. I support Senator Scott's suggestion that Mr. Urbekite <laughs> do some significant heavy lifting for us. <laughs> and we could actually pass something on this subject. Committee, as you know, and to Ms. Urbekite's point, we've heard um, extreme criticism of the bill draft in front of us. But if you recall from our last meeting, this entire interim topic was about to be dead on arrival. We had no bill draft. We had nothing to work. All we were told is that we couldn't do it, right? Despite the fact on our first meeting in Hewlett, we had private developers, contractors fly in. Uh, we had the Wyoming Association of Municipalities. We had the realtors. We had Ms. Burkle. All of those stakeholders came in, private industry, Senator Case, that said, hey, we need more options for housing in Wyoming and accessible housing, uh, really for uh, working adults, right, for those starter homes and different options available. That's why the committee continued, took this up as an interim topic and continued to move it forward. At our last meeting, there was nothing to do. So I threw out, as a Hail Mary, uh, this land bank idea with the go with Nebraska. Um, it does not work for us, and there is significant work that needs to be done. Uh, but if we want to be responsive in a way that we were back in May, uh, I, I believe that it's important that we continue the topic and we allow the stakeholders to bring something forward that is workable for them. And I know that the realtors are, are very well suited to do such a thing. Mr. Chairman, if, if I can respond real briefly. Why don't you agree? I, I do agree that we do need to continue working on workforce housing and, and attainable housing in Wyoming. But to Senator Scott's um, comment, I've thought for several years, and I believe I've testified in front of this committee maybe several years ago, that we need to take a real look at our um, eminent domain and blighted areas, urban renewal statutes, they are really far out of date, really, really. And so I think that might be an area we want to explore in conjunction with this. Um, but I think, you know, this bill is it's lengthy and and it just needs tightened up a lot. And certainly I would be more than happy to work with the rest of the stock st stakeholders in in working on that. Appreciate that. Another further question for the realtors? Seeing none. Uh, there are public comments on this bill. 
Not seeing any. Let me make sure there's no one. Senator Scott, go ahead. I'm just going to check the internet to make sure I don't have any hands. I don't. Senator Scott, thoughts? Mr. Chairman, I think we ought to take Zerbakite up on her offer and see if she's willing to head an effort with the stakeholders to get us a workable bill. I think the work the LSO has done in putting the Nebraska bill into Wyoming bill format <clears throat> gives a very useful template for to start with and amending an existing proposition that is, has worked elsewhere. And having had heard some of the difficulties we have with it, uh, that gives them a good start. And I would suggest that um, contingent on management council approval, that we have a target date of the first meeting of this joint interim committee uh, in the next session. So target date probably next May, something like that. I uh, would give them give them time. I don't think it's reasonable to do it between now and the session. That's kind of an encouragement to move it into the next session and continue working on it. I don't know, Ms. Urbekite, if you need official marching orders, but I know the people in the room will reach out to you and your organization, and, um, and I know there are certainly people on this side of the dais who are happy to work on the issue, too, who want to see something move forward, because um, our constituencies, uh, Oliver Wyoming, want something to move forward to help out. So. Um, not seeing any motion unless anyone wants to make a motion on that bill draft at this time. You want to table it? Okay. Motion to table on the floor. Not debatable. All those. Ms. Go ahead, Senator Scott. Chairman, is that order. motion to table include a respectful request to the Realtors Association to try to get us a work? Yes. With the understanding of I mean, the Licensed coming... Agent Association. Okay. <laughs> Sure. With that understanding that uh, there's some pressure for next year on moving forward on this issue. All those in favor of motion table, say aye. 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 Those say no. Okay, we're going to table that. Do you want to have a five-minute break? I don't. Okay. When I say five minutes, we all know it'll be 15. So uh, five-minute break until four o'clock. We'll come back and talk about utility law.
All right, welcome back. Next up is a very simple two-page bill. LSO Working Draft 127, State Assessment of Independent Power Producers. As you know, committee, we've um, dealt with this bill two times in the interim. It was a committee bill last year for revenue. Um, so here we are again today with some more amendments and continued discussion. Um, Mr. Anderson, I don't know if you want to kick us off with the basics of what the bill does. Mr. Chairman, Josh Anderson, LSO. As you noted, uh, this was previously a, uh, a joint revenue committee bill. I guess a little history. The, the Department of Revenue um, had kind of historically been um, assessing these types of properties um, along with other types of electric utilities or other public utilities. Um, they looked closer at it and uh, thought they may not actually have the authority to to value um, these properties. And so this was a bill that revenue looked at to just make clear that the, depart the department is required to <laughs> annually val value and assess property of independent power producers, which operate facilities for the generation or transmission of electricity for wholesale. Um, so it clearly give the department that authority that uh, failed uh, in the revenue committee. It's requested to be brought back this year um, here in this committee. And just another note there that uh, currently the effective date is uh, January 1 of 2024. And as we discussed kind of at the end of last meeting, that's typically how we would do this just because the tax year starts on January 1, which would be after um, or before this bill would be potentially considered and passed by the legislature. So that's the bill, Mr. Chairman. I take any questions. Um, so, Mr. Anderson, the effective date or the bill was changed to be 2023 with the start of this tax year. Do you know of any difficulties if it was uh, to go into effect immediately upon signing that we couldn't start with the 2023 tax year? So, so Mr. Chairman, if you made it effective immediately, you know, it. I don't know. Hard to say, you know, the, the uh, counties have already begun kind of ramping up for this, assuming that the, they would be valuing this and the property is valued on that January 1 date. Um, so that's where uh, the potential concern might be. Um, you know, I think what the reports uh, would be due, <clears throat> the initial reports of property would be due, I think, by March 1. It could be extended to April 1, so I think that would, you know, that timeline gets pretty close on, on when the counties would already be taking action, um, even if it went into effect immediately. So that's where that issue comes in. Uh, certainly there's other people in the room that might uh, speak to that, but that was just a concern we had discussed at that last meeting. Okay. Other questions for our staff attorney? Seeing none, thank you much. Um, Department of Revenue, it technically affects you and you're in the room, so I thought I'd just see if you had any comments. I'm going to keep trying to get you up for today sometime, Brenda, but not yet, huh? All right, um, someone in favor of the bill is probably best to start with the explanation of why they believe we should make this move. Um, anybody wish to speak in favor of the bill? Mr. Brown? I assume somebody was designated. You bringing the taxpayers with you too? Okay. So. <clears throat> Go ahead, Chris. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Chris Brown representing Powering Up Wyoming. Um, we do stand in support of the bill and of the state maintaining the assessment of independent power producers as they have for many years. Um, as outlined in the document that I sent to you all last evening, our position is based on maintaining a stable tax climate that treats wind generation facilities equally. Without this bill, um, wind farms that are rate regulated utilities will continue to be assessed with the, by the state, while independent power producers will be assessed locally by an out of state third party. From our position, Mr. Chairman, both, um, both uh, plants have the same infrastructure and should be assessed by the same entity. Um, from a stability perspective, 
even though the counties with wind have all contracted with the same out of state third party contractor to do the assessments. There's nothing in statute that guarantees that moving forward hypothetically each county could technically choose a different third party to help them assess those and that's concerning to us. Likewise, Mr. Chairman, there's been previous discussion that has stated that most of these projects are within county boundaries, but that's not the case with every single project. An example is the Two Rivers project being built in Albany and, Count and Carbon County. That project will span over county lines and be within two counties. And so hypothetically, down the road, if there wasn't a uniform out-of-state third-party company doing these assessments, there could be two different companies assessing that property. Um, the assessor's initial concern was um, to have the ability to be able to access additional information from the state if an assessment came out differently than they expected. And the industry has made a number of attempts to meet with the assessors and find some common ground and some compromise. We've so far been unsuccessful, but there is an amendment I noticed that was posted um, with the committee materials today. Should the committee choose to uh, consider that amendment, that is an amendment that we would stand in support of. Um, and so, Mr. Chairman, on behalf of my client, it's our position that the assessment of independent power producers should maintain and stay with the state as it has been. Um, and I'm happy to stand for questions. So, so Mr. Brennan, I just want to be fair. Historically, for however long the state Department of Revenue has assessed all power facilities, um, power plants, etc. And then based on a decision, it's probably the easiest way to say it for the past two years, or two cycles, local county assessors have been assessing these independent power producers or is the Department of Revenue has that have they had one year yet of the counties assessing um, independent power producers? And if this bill does not pass, they will have at least one, if not two years. Would that be a correct statement? Mr. Chairman, I would respectfully submit no. Um, the counties have not uh, assessed independent power producers yet. If this bill does not pass, they will absolutely be in that position. If this bill does pass, I think there's some gray area as to whether or not um, the state will be able to maintain the assessment uh, continuously or not. I know the counties have begun that work, um, and it's our position that the state should maintain that continuity of the assessment. Further questions, uh, Senator Scott. The outfit you identified as your clients, what's the name again and who, who, who is it? Who comprises it? I've not absolutely. heard it before. Sure. Mr. Chairman and Senator Scott, thank you. My client is Powering Up Wyoming. For the past two and a half years, we've been a grassroots organization um, that has actively recruited about 5,000 interested parties across the state to support renewable energy, wind, solar, and storage as part of an all of the above energy strategy with our legacy industries in the state. So would it be correct to say that an independent power producer in your organization, it could also be a solar plant, it could be a wind plant, could hypothetically even be a new nuclear uh, plant that would come online in Wyoming. Would that be an independent power producer under this statute, in your opinion, if we were to have a small scale nuclear? Mr. Chairman, if it was owned by an independent company, yes. If a rate regulated company purchased them, no. But hypothetically, yes, that could be the case. And is there any other independent power production entities that aren't wind, solar, nuclear I should be thinking of? Not that. Not that concern my client, Mr. Chairman. I, I don't know broadly, but I don't believe so. Other further questions? Seeing none. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Harp Street. Welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Ashley Harp Street, Wyoming Taxpayers Association. Per my previous testimony, positions that we take are based on an analysis of the legislation against our cornerstones of taxation through our policy committee, and then it's forwarded on to our 21 member board of directors for a decision. In the analysis, as we mentioned, we look at those four cornerstones. Is the tax justified? Is the tax equitable among taxpayers? Does the proposal create a stable tax revenue stream? And finally, is the tax transparent, visible, accountable, and audible? 
Based off that criteria, Mr. Chairman, we support 23 LSO 0727 state assessment of independent power producers as it stands to be sound tax policy for the following reasons. It is justified as the tax statute clarification is needed to have the statute match longstanding practice of assessing all plants alike, according to previous testimony from the Wyoming Department of Revenue. It is fiscally prudent for the state and for the counties to keep all power plants and electric infrastructure assessed by the same state entity. The Wyoming Department of Revenue already has this expertise, the data, the comparable property information, and the ability to continue uniformly assessing all electric properties every year. It is equitable as, all, as this ta tax statute clarification will assure that all similarly situated taxpayers in the electric and industry sector will all continue to be treated equally and uniformly in terms of property tax assessment and valuation. Additionally, this assures that the constitutional principles of just valuation and uniform assessment are met for all alike taxpayers in the electric se sector. It is stable as the bill will maintain the current practice avoiding potential volatility and property tax assessment that may result from lack of uniformity in assessments across jurisdictions, which could also create volatility in the allocation of wind generation tax revenue to the counties, which is based on relative property tax values. This tax statute clarification assures the continuation of stable, consistent, predictable property tax assessments and valuation treatment for alike taxpayers. It is transparent as the tax statute clarification provides clarity and visibility to an existing practice. Wyoming Department of Revenue is ready and capable to continue the assessment of independent power producers just as they always have. Additionally, as I stated before, it is cost effective to collect as this does not require an additional contract and the Wyoming Department of Revenue already has the expertise the data, the comparable property information, and the ability to continue uniformly assessing all electric properties every year. Thank you. Any questions? Senator Case. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Ms. Harpstreet, is it your testimony that electric utilities and independent power producers are assessed in the same manner now? Under the past, statutes before this last one did yes. not get through if if it is if it's all assessed by the same person or same entity which would be the department of revenue this yes mr chairman um so i'd submit to you that they're not they're very different because one is a regulated utility whose costs are filed with the public service commission and we know their investments we don't have to infer the investments so they're actually assess very differently you have to use different methods to get to the pieces and i think we're going to hear about that in further testimony so i think it would be a fallacy to say that because they're assessed by the same entity they're assessed in the same way and and i and because the electric utilities you know you have collaborating publicly available sometimes uh under sealed order but because they are regulated by the Public Service Commission and also file reports with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. It's a different animal completely. And so I think you ought to look into that a little bit more because they're, they're not treated the same. And I think that's part of the reason that this has come up. Uh, response, do you want one, Ashley? Mr. Chairman, Senator Case. I appreciate that comment back and we'll let the industry explain how they may be similarly situated or and Department of Revenue um, on on their thoughts on how they currently assess them, but I would say in our testimony besides that point that you're trying to. Um, pull out it's also prudent to keep it cost effective in a place that already is doing it has all that data has the. Uh, has the uh, expertise to continue to assess it. Mr. Chairman, follow up. Uh, Ms. Harpstreet, in a, in, a, in a healthy tax system, do you think it's a good idea to have an appeal once in a while to kind of find out what happens? You think that would be a good idea? Mr. Chairman, Senator Case, of course we do. Okay. Follow up. Mr. Chairman, Ms. Harpstreet, do you know when the last time there was an appeal of wind industry valuation for tax purposes? Mr. Chairman, Senator Case, I would have to look into that. 
Ms. Harpstray, I might, Mr. Chairman, I might submit, submit that it was in 2011. And then it involved a very trivial manner where the Department of Revenue had actually overcounted the number of windmills that a company had installed and also included in the valuation uh, the cost of retirement of those facilities. And it was a fairly simple uh, appeal for Duke Power to win that on based on two very simple trivial questions that the Department of Revenue come up short. And there has been no appeals since. And I wonder about that in the world of, you know, if you're not close to the edge, you're not going to have, I guess you're not going to have any appeals. So I appreciate your comments about that is how we can be so certain that we've gotten it right so far. Um, we'll take that as rhetorical unless you want to respond, but if you don't, Senator Scott. Mr. Chairman, question either for the taxpayers or Senator Case, I'm not quite sure who's the most appropriate. Uh, are other large industrial uh, facilities in the state, my understanding is that some of the things like oil refineries uh, are assessed at the state level. I'm not clear, is that true? And how many, how many other different kinds of large industrial facilities are assessed at the state level? Ms. Harpstreet, if you know or sure. want to venture in. Mr. Chairman, Senator Scott, I will phone a friend at the Department of Revenue mm -hmm. that could certainly tell you what, what they do. And Mr. Chairman, with your leeway, I can answer the question. Sure. Refineries are uh, uh, assessed at the local level, county level. Um, the state's power to assess property is very limited. And there's a list of uh, eight things, I guess nine things now. Um, but minerals are assessed at the state level the production value. But the plant that's used to produce minerals and refine minerals and do whatever with minerals is a locally assessed item. So refineries are locally assessed. On that list of nine, are there some other large industrial things or is it? May I read, I'll read the list, Mr. Chairman, if you wish. Sure, go ahead. Okay, the first one is the gross product of all mines and mining claims. That's the mineral production. The second is property of pipeline companies, which cross many counties and extend long distance. You got an issue of dividing it up among the counties. The property of electric utilities, which is where the ad has been hung before, that these aren't electric utilities. They very definitely aren't. The property of railroad companies, which have the same transversing clear across the state, the property of rail car companies, which um, I'm not sure why that got in there. And I think you could argue both ways on that. No. And I'm not sure what a rail car company is. Mr. Chairman. Sure, Senator Scott. It's, it's a company that owns rail cars and, and leases them. We do have a system for collecting property taxes okay. on those. I think probably based on how many they have on average in the state. And where they are. Uh, you see reporting marks like UTLX, I see. United Tank Car Company. That's that would be a rail car company, I believe. Mr. Chairman, it thank you very much, Senator Scott. And it does make sense to assess that to the state because they're they don't belong to any one place. They yeah. they are ephemeral throughout the state. So that, that property tax has to be divided up as well. The property of telecommunications companies, the property of other public utilities. So so far this list is very Clear. Then it gets a little uh, uh, convoluted. The next one is lease property consisting of warehouses, storage facilities, and office structures, and any other property that is in support of which is used or held for use for the attack activities listed in this subsection, meaning at least properties supporting all those other things, utilities, railroads. I think that's what that means. If lease property is assessed to the leasee, it shall not be assessed to the property owner. The next one is the property of cable and satellite television companies, kind of for the same reason, multiple counties, plant. And then uh, the next one is when we added property of airline companies uh, used for public transportation of passengers or property for hire. That one doesn't have the multi-county implications. It's certainly got several counties, I suppose, but not, it's not the same venue as utility. 
But from this list, Mr. Chairman, you can see that it's very clearly about public utilities and other things where they're collaborating, for the most part, collaborating economic information, as well as this fact that it's a common plant that has to be, that serves customers under regulated situation that has to be parceled out to the counties involved. So these facilities are much more like refineries, mine processing plants, you know, those kind of things. I'll shut up, sorry. Any other questions for the Taxpayers Association? As much as we like having her on the hot seat, we'll probably let her off. Thank you. Thanks. Other public comments on the bill? Sir, welcome. Day. I'll try to make it short. Okay. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Dick Marklin. I uh, represent the Wyoming Solar Coalition. I'm a lot smaller than what the previous uh, witness testified to. I've got a little over 200 members, 63 dogs and 11 cats. A little levity here. Uh, my comments center around Clarification. Every one of you in this room and a lot of folks in, in the back and probably this entire building understand what independent power producers means. I'm here to tell you I've received phone calls from my members questioning whether or not they're going to be included in this because some of them have systems that are producing 150%, 200 plus percent each and every month. And they sell back to Black Hills Energy in this town at a wholesale rate, which currently is three cents on the kilowatt. They, can, uh, they think they're going to be considered as an independent power producer. If we can clarify what independent power producers is, we'd go a long ways in satisfying those of us who have solar or wind or are planning on purchasing some. We already pay tax, property tax, on our systems that we have. All I want, I talked to a representative here this morning and he says this only applies to wind farms and solar farms. Okay, fine. Clarify that. What's, what's the big deal with just saying independent power producers? And it's already been established, uh, Mr. Chairman, you asked the question whether or not a nuclear plant down the road would be falling into this category. And I think the response was no. Right now we have wind power, we have solar power. And they're, they're, the utility companies, the electric utility companies are building their own farms, both types. Black Hills Energy's doing it, Rocky Mountain Power's doing it. I'm not sure what Montana Dakota utility is doing. But they're already buy, uh, building farms in other states. Colorado, for example, Rocky Mountain Power is there, so is Black Hills Energy. I'm just asking for you folks to consider clarifying what that is. And you each had a handout that uh, I asked to be handed out to you. I could support this fully if we could go along with the amendment that I had passed out to each one of you with regards to setting out an exemption for those of us that are customer generators in line with the Wyoming statute 3716101. That's the net metering laws. And most of you have known I've been before you since 2019 on net metering. All I'm asking for is clarification and support those of us that have it by adding this amendment that you have in your hands. You want me to read it for the record for the other folks in attendance or? Okay. 
I'd like to see on the, the draft bill 23 LOS 0127 on page 2 line 7 after the word wholesale insert the following. This subsection does not apply to property of a customer generator who is generating electricity pursuant to Wyoming statute 3716-101. And I would like to request that the committee entertain a motion to adopt this amendment that I've submitted for your consideration. Okay. Senator Scott, go ahead. Yeah. Question on the definition in 3616-101. Does that, in, uh, I understand that would include the people with small windmills, uh, yes. solar generators and whatnot. Yes. Does it include a large industrial co-generator? <laughs> that I don't have the answer for, Senator. Mr. Chairman. That's May we ask LSO what's in that definition? Josh, if you know, or Anna. And Mr. Chairman, just a working definition, it's limited to 25 megawatts or less. Yes. It's, uh, so it's small. It's yes. small. Under that definition. Is that correct, Josh? That's correct, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, Representative Roscoe. Uh, if I could uh, ask Mr. Merklin, so that would, that would mean the Customer generators are, uh, they're dealing only in, uh, um, not dealing in, in selling their, um, their generated electricity back to a public utility uh, at a wholesale price. Is that, so, some of that, I didn't really clarify that, I'm sorry. <laughs> some of that is taking place, yes. Further, Senator Scott. Chairman, am I right in thinking the practical effect of this amendment is that these uh, home generating units, small generating units, will continue to be assessed by their local county assessor that assess their homes uh, and everything as else? As property Mr. tax Merklin. attributed to the size and the property, yes. Okay. We believe that to be correct. And Mr. Chairman. Senator Case. I think that's true. If the bill were to succeed, we could put in this carve out, which is fine. Nobody wants to get this anyway. But if the bill doesn't go forward, we don't need the carve out because the assess it's in the same realm as the assessors anyway. Okay, further questions, Mr. Merklin? At the appropriate time, we'll talk about amendments. Thank you very much. Can you take action on the uh, amendment? When the, if the bill is moved at that time, we will ask for any amendments and any member of the committee is welcome to move it at that time. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments. Welcome, Mr. Eggers. In the old days, we used to get walled here all the time and it's a rarity now, but welcome back to corporations. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, pleasure to appear before you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Walter Eggers, for the record, and I'm here representing the American Clean Power Association, ACP. And first and foremost, I just want to uh, state that ACP supports uh, the bill that is before you, as well as the amendment that Mr. Brown mentioned that has been posted today. Um, I won't repeat what I think Mr. Brown and other speakers have said very well, but would like to address a couple of issues that have come up um, in questions, and then, of course, answer any questions you may have for me. Um, first of all, I, it is absolutely true that the default for property taxation assessment in the state of Wyoming is local assessment, county assessment. And the legislature has established a list of categories of taxpayers and property that will be assessed by the state. And that's a list that has evolved over time. It's the list that Senator Case uh, read earlier. And my point in, in bringing us back to that is those have been legislative determinations, that the policy supports state assessment in those various categories. It is true that regulated utilities, utilities regulated by the Public Service Commission, are state-assessed uh, taxpayers and state-assessed property. But there are also 
categories of property in that list that are not regulated by the Public Service Commission. Airlines is an example, railroads, rail cars, and so forth. And so as the list has developed, this legislature has made the policy decision that those uh, categories of property should be state assessed. And it's our position that this category, independent power producers, the property of independent power producers, should be state assessed because the facilities, the hard facilities on the ground in the field are very similar to the facilities that the uh, state is assessing when it assesses public utilities that are operating wind, solar, et cetera. So we think as a policy matter, it makes sense that these IPP independent power producer uh, category of properties should continue to be state assessed. Now, the history was um, recounted earlier about why we're here and, and sort of what, how, how, how we led to this point. And I just, just wanna make clear, IPP property has, has always been state assessed um, in Wyoming. And that was an interpretation by the Department of Revenue originally, and that's the way it was administered. And there have been some memos and guidance documents from the Department of Revenue, including, a, a, I think, an important memo in 2017, where they described how the assessment was going to occur and why state assessment was occurring under the statute. Now, it's true that um, the director of the Department of Revenue a couple of years ago um, interpreted the statute and said, no, these IPP properties don't clearly fit into these categories. Um, I think I think I think there could be uh, a, a clearer statement uh, than there is right now, and that's why we're here before you and have been before you before. Uh, but but the, but the policy reason is solid, and the, and that's why we are uh, supporting this bill and asking you to clarify that the status quo should remain in place, that this property should continue to be assessed by the state. And I I want to briefly discuss the the question that was raised at the very beginning about the amendment and how it deals with the effective date. Um, it is our position that for tax year 2023, we hope that the continuity stays in place. We hope that the Department of Revenue continues to assess this property as it has in 2022, 2021, 2020, and before. So as a matter of continuity and consistency, we would hope that the legislature decides that this applies for uh, tax year 2023. The tax year on, in the property tax system is a, it's a calendar. It's not one, there's not one specific point you can, you can point to um, in, in the calendar and say that's, that's what the property tax is. It's true, as was said earlier, that January 1st of the tax year, that's the lien date. That's the date on which we say, okay, it's the value of the property on that date that we measure the property tax by. But the process extends into the tax year. The taxpayer pays, uh, files returns in March or April, and then the, um, the county assessment goes out, the assessment goes out to the taxpayer in late April, and that's then subject to appeal. So I, I think it's appropriate to maintain continuity, to maintain consistency, that, that th this bill, the, the affirmation that this will be state assessed property continue in uh, 2023. And we think that's workable. We understand that given the debates that have occurred over the past couple of years, um, that there is work being done at the, at the county level for uh, tax year 2023. That's not uncommon. Um, the county assessment of complex property frequently begins the year before, late in the year before, so late 2022, starting to get ready to do the assessment for 2023. Um, but we think that the, that the continuity outweighs um, the, 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 the question of whether the counties have been doing some work for 2023. So we'd hope that the 2023 tax year remains in uh, the assessment of the state. With that, I will stop and thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Eker. So I guess my concern is the narrative I have heard, and it's not the narrative I just heard from you was, State had always done this when it came to utilities, and then these kind of independent power producers uh, started springing up, and it just was until really the department said, oh, these technically aren't what we think they are, 
but your testimony seemed to indicate that there had been this question before in the Department of Revenue, and they made a conscious choice at some point to say, yeah, we think these are separate, but we should still be regulating them, and there was any type of public process or um, conversation? Just wanted to check on that. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the question, and I'm sorry that if, I, if I wasn't clear there. I think the Department of Revenue, it's safe to say, did make a conscious decision that it was going to state assess the property of independent power producers a decade ago. And I think they based that on, as Senator Case read, the, the section that says property of electric utilities is state assessed. And then interestingly, three lines later, it says property of other public utilities. And so I think what the department had decided is these are electric utilities, even if they're not public utilities, and therefore they should be state assessed. And I think the department's memos prior to the decision two years ago, the interpretation two years ago by the current director, I think the memos supported that that was the decision that they made. But I, I'm not at all suggesting that there was a public or, or debate there. Senator Case, I'm just guessing you have a question. Well, Mr. Chairman, I just kind of want to ask a question about one thing. It's, it's, um, I, I appreciate the testimony, Ms., Mr. Eggers. And Mr. Eggers, um, you know, if we were to pass a bill out of this committee today, there's, there's no guarantee that it would pass the legislature. It might pass the legislature. Um, it might have a great chance of passing legislature. It might not have a great chance of passing legislature. So then what happens? Let's, let's assume um, it doesn't pass. And then that clearly places it back in the counties. You know, it, it's in the counties now. So, but yet I think according to your kind of testimony, you're implying that we shouldn't be doing anything at the county level now because there's going to be this bill in the future. But they have a legal requirement to assess. And we don't know if the bill's going to pass. So it's sort of like a game of chicken a little bit. And, and I, I, want to, I want to drill more down on your conclusions. And if we actually went to court about what the implications of this, what we know at the time, and who should be doing what. Um, how can you say counties don't do anything? Because you have an obligation to tax all property according to the Constitution. So you're trying to say be on hold because this bill might come through? And I don't think we can legally do that. Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Case. I think that's an excellent question. Um, what has occurred in 2022 and 2021 is that the Department of Revenue has let the, this legislative process play out to see if there would be a, a, the clarification legislation that has been requested and is before you today. And the Department of Revenue has continued to conduct the state assessment that it's done before. And, and, and that's important. Let me just drop a quick footnote here. I think in property tax assessment, there is a benefit to yearly, you know, year after year property tax assessment, because it, it, in whatever category of property you're talking about, property tax assessments will build on the prior year's assessment. Each tax year stands alone, but that prior history is important. And so to get back to your question, um, we would we would hope that this bill would pass, but we would also hope that the state would continue to assess until there's a determination um, that it should not. And I, I, I can't, and I please don't hear me as, as suggesting any uh, fault on the part of any of the county entities in moving ahead with the work that they're doing. I, I understand that there's important work that's done in the lat, latter part of the year before the tax year when it comes to complex property. You mentioned the refineries, for example. I think the experts that, that the outside experts that work on refinery assessment are out there in October and November of the year before visiting the property and starting the work that needs to be done. So I please don't hear me as saying, as being critical at all of the counties for being ready if the legislature determines that this is, uh, this should be county assessed, but, but we would hope that it maintains the status quo and stays with the state. Mr. Chairman, I think, I, I just think, and Mr. Eggers, I think it's an interesting uh, concurrence here. Um, or occlusion, I'm not sure what the right word is, but um, the Department of Revenue has vacated this space. 
the counties are doing their job. And there's been arguments about the interpretation of this. And I don't see how we can just say counties, we're going to, what you're doing is not going to have implications and be effective for the year. And that somehow the Department of Revenue is going to magically decide that they either need back in this space or that we are going to pass a law to force that. I mean, it's, there's a lot of what ifs there. Right, Mr. Eggers? Mr. Chairman, Senator Case, I, I, I don't disagree with your comments and I understand why the counties would be doing what they're doing. Um, we think that that is, we think that the work that's being done pursuant to the contracts that they have with their outside experts doesn't lock us in for property tax assessment by the counties in tax year 2023. And, and, and the point there is really that calendar I was referring to earlier. The taxpayer is required to submit a list of property, basically it's tax returns, at the beginning of March. That can be extended to the beginning of April. Then by the fourth Monday in April, the assessors are sending out the assessments, which is the document that's subject to appeal if there's a, if there's a controversy there. So I think that it's, it's important to look at this as a calendar that goes well into the tax year. So for this purpose, 2023, um, that there will still be work being done by the taxpayers and then by the ultimate assessor um, on, on tax year 23 assessments. I think we're going to disagree, but thank you, Mr. Eggers. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Other questions for Walt? Seeing none, thank you again. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, while the next witness is coming up, whoever that is, I misspoke earlier when I said the net metering facilities were 25 megawatts. That, that was blow my head away. It's 25 kilowatts, which is uh, <laughs> an order of magnitude smaller, right? very That's small. we all heard. Yeah, so yeah, but yeah. it's kilowatts. And I'm just, did I really say that? It's a common mistake that people make, but it's a really significant one. Okay, sorry. Oh, if you're going to come this far forward, you might as well just come out of the chair, Ms. Huxville. Welcome. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, um, Dixie Huxtable, Converse County Assessor, and my colleague um, from Sweetwater County. And the reason I didn't come all the way up, I wasn't sure if we were to the other side yet, because I, you had asked for people that were supportive of the bill, and, and we have a position opposing it. So I didn't want to oh, really? intrude. Oh. All right, we are. We're happy to see you now. Oh, thank you, sir. Um, I'm going to defer to my colleague to start with, and then I will follow up with some comments, and we'll both be available for questions. I am Dave Davis, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm the Sweetwater County Assessor and the current president of the Wyoming County Assessors Association. I had sent you all an email earlier in the week uh, with our points on this issue. And what I want to point out, a lot of the comments that we've heard up to this point is kind of changing my testimony. But if I can refer you to the pictures that were included in that documentation, you can see the facility on the top of that is a facility that is currently being valued by our industrial appraisers which would also be charged with valuing these, these um, independent power producers. That is a Trona mine west of Green River, and it is an extremely complicated, heavy industrial facility that our appraisers have been working on for decades. They can do this work. Um, the, the picture down below is a picture from the website of the uh, solar facility in Sweetwater County that was just recently commissioned it's actually been on the tax rolls now for three years and that's a picture from their website of that facility and you can again see the level of complexity in the appraisal for those two property types i'm very confident our industrial appraisers can value these properties and value them fairly um, in the document that i had sent you i actually misspoke house bill 109 was referenced at the top and that's actually the acquisition value study it's been kind of stuck in my head for a while um, but actually the legislation that came in the last session was Senate file 20 and then House Bill 151. And we as assessors oppose that legislation just like we're opposing this one. Um, one of the things that has not been mentioned at this point is the question we get as local assessors is, is the independent power producer industry paying their fair share? And we honestly don't know. Um, the appraisal is confidential between the Department of Revenue and the taxpayer. And the taxpayer has the ability to appeal that appraisal just as Senator Case had mentioned. We as local assessors don't get the ability to appeal that value. We don't have standing in that appraisal, and we shouldn't. That appraisal is done by the department for that taxpayer. 
And I'm not saying any anybody did anything wrong, but I have an example from Sweetwater County that I think is very relevant. Um, our solar facility, the one I mentioned, had done our planning and zoning um, presentation. And over the life of that project, they had stated that that project was going to generate $17 million worth of property taxes for the life of that project, that 30 year life. We've had three appraisals on it from the department. And again, I'm not saying they did anything wrong, but the estimates of taxes for that same 30 year period that will actually come about is $4 million. So as assessors, we have concerns. And again, no, no, not right or wrong, just concerns. We want to know what's going on and we want to know why. Um, what's happening is we're getting questions from our taxpayers, we're getting questions from our county commissioners, we're getting questions from the other industrial producers in the area. They want to know what's going on and why and whether they're paying their fair share. And we honestly just can't answer. We just don't know. Um, but you don't think you don't think anyone did anything wrong and it's a $13 million discrepancy? I, well, I, I, there, there's something different. And, and again, I'm not going to point fingers. It could have been something, you know, planning and zoning um, documents sometimes are dog and pony shows. There's, there could have been somebody carried a one and didn't mean to. I, I, don't, I don't know because I don't have any idea how the math was done. So I, I'm not going to point fingers. Um, but it's been said when we had, did have discussions with the IPP industry that maybe this was just one bad apple in the industry. Well, it's all of my independent power producers and I'm the assessor for Sweetwater County. So again, I have concerns. Um, the industry also mentioned uniformity and the assessors want uniformity as well. That's why we have all, all of the seven counties that have these property types have agreed to use the same appraisal firm, same methodologies, same appraisers, um, same trending, same depreciation, all of those factors that go into an appraisal of this property type will be handled by the same entity. So we think the uniformity issue has been addressed. Now back to what we've done to get started. We have gone to our boards of county commissioners because again, this legislation failed in the last session. So by default, we are supposed to value these properties. So we have done site inspections. We have adjusted contracts. The budgets have been amended. Um, we are in the process of valuing these. I did the site inspection on the solar facility a couple weeks ago. So the work is, is, has already gotten started. The amendment that the um, industry has proposed, and, and I cannot speak on this in behalf of the entire association because the amendment is new and we have not voted on it as a group. But I can tell you as the Sweetwater County Assessor, it really makes no difference to me. Um, if I can, if I do not have standing and I can't appeal the appraisal, how they came up with it makes no difference. I would just assume not know at that point because that way I, I avoid that frustration. I've got enough frustration in going on. Um, but those are the comments um, that I have for the association and I would stand for any questions. Um, Assessor Huxtable will clarify anything I missed and, and will hopefully take care of any questions you have. Well, do you want to go first then Dixie and then we'll ask questions in general? Sure. Um, again, Dixie Huxtable, and I just I just want to touch on a couple of things that have been talked about already. Um, initial concerns of the assessors is exactly as it was stated. We didn't know whether the values, whether the taxpayers were paying their fair share because we didn't know how they were calculated. We knew they were paying what they were assessed, but whether that was their fair share, we didn't know. Um, we didn't have the ability to see the appraisals. We have no access. We get to see the annual reports but we do not get to see the appraisals as those are confidential. And so to that point, the amendment that's been put out there to uh, give uh, the assessors the ability to review the documents upon request, the department shall uh, provide information related to us for our review. It's still very comp it's, it's still confidential. It, you can't share it with anybody. You can't ask any questions. You can't appeal it. And so I would concur with my colleague that I'm not sure that that does anything but just add frustration to the whole level. Um, I can't share it with my commissioners. I can't share it with anybody that's asking me those questions. Um, the other part of that bill is what's already been talked about, effective immediately. I do have some very grave concerns about that language. I am responsible for taxing, uh, locating, valuing, and taxing all the property in my county. And as of January 1st, 2023, that includes five independent power producers in my county. And I will be assessing them. I have contracts in place. We've started the, the on the ground reviews. We've started the process of reaching out to those companies and getting the information we need, historical, 
and current so that we can start valuing. I will be sending them a notice of valuation. Now, if this bill should pass and go through the legislation and become effective, honestly, I think the courts are going to make that decision for me because unless it's clear by your group as a tax policy, the way I read it on January 1st, this is my responsibility and this is what I will be doing. I want to talk just a little bit about the third party. We have heard a lot about the department has expertise and experts on staff. So do we. We have third party contractors that, that, that are going to be doing this and that's all they do is wind farms across the country, independent and regulated. So they are experts at this and they are helping us be consistent and as accurate as we can be. County lines were talked about. Um, we do have properties now that we value locally that come across county lines, a pipeline. I don't know what, how you guys all interpret a pipeline, but a pipeline to me is a pipe in the ground that transports some kind of mineral. State assesses those that are FERC regulated. They are in the statutes, they assess those. But I have the same similar size pipelines in my county that I'm responsible for. They start in my neighboring county, go through me, and go to another neighboring county. We value those as a whole and allocate to the counties based on where the assets are located. So I don't think across county lines is going to be the issue. The FERC regulated, the public reg regulation is the bigger question. Um, absolutely no problem with this, the state valuing those. That's where it should be. They are using approved uh, methodologies to appraisal. I have no doubt in my mind. I absolutely believe they're following the same appraisal theory that we will be, the same approaches. I do think that there's a little bit difference in a unitary approach when you're talking about the regulated companies, uh, the big companies where they value the company and ask and then uh, allocate that value based on the assets on the ground. The independent power producers in my county, that value is tied to that wind farm. I can give you a value for that wind farm for that taxpayer in my county. The department provided it last year, I'm going to provide it this year. I cannot give you a value for the wind farm in my county that's owned by a regulated company. The department does not have a value for that wind farm. It's part of a bigger piece of a value that sits in my county. It sits in a tax district that has a major power plant. So there's no way to distinguish what those values are for me. So while they're using the same methodology and the same appraisal theories, they are not valued the same way. You cannot get a value for that wind farm for the regulated companies. Um, I, lastly, the data that's reported. We are a self-reporting state. We've all heard that. That's absolutely true. The Department of Revenue is, is relying on that taxpayer reported, provided data, just like we will be. We will have people on the ground reviewing that data and going through the assets. The department has that same ability to do that. Uh, I have not went on a state assessed uh, inspection with them um, in, in the last 15 years that I've been an assessor uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, resources, economic, COVID, name them all, the department hasn't been able to be there, but my staff has been on the ground. I've been out to those wind turbines and I know how they work. So we will have, in my opinion, the most uh, up-to-date data that we can get our hands on and we have good working relationships with these companies and we absolutely anticipate that to continue. Um, I would stand for any questions. Um, I do have some other statistics of facilities in my county. Uh, Dave gave you the one in Sweet Sweetwater County. I have three in my county that when I look at those uh, initial permit applications and they gave the estimate of ad valorem taxes that would be paid over a span, and I can give you the actual numbers, they do not correlate, significantly do not. Their report says they'll pay me 13 million, they actually paid me eight. So I, I don't want to bore you with the statistics, but I have them and I'm happy to share them with you if anybody has any questions and then I would stand for any questions. Hello. I, I guess I have a, just a major one, and I'm not trying to be um, too pushy here, but it does concern me, right, that all of our assessors are saying in these, what, seven counties, that they're hiring this company, and the company is, I think, out of Texas. I'm pretty sure I know what company it is, and you've already signed contracts with this company, and I just have to, I'm sure it's public knowledge what your contracts are, 
but there has to be a huge expense to hire with a private company who does this, that comes in and tells you what that assessed valuation is, that costs the taxpayers in your county significant amount of money, and I know there are a significant amount of money with the assessment, but it, so my, my financial question is, is it really, is it worth it for all of our counties to be contracting with a third party that I would assume is probably the only one in the marketplace who can charge a fairly high rate when the taxpayers are already paying through other means the Department of Revenue who's been doing this historically and maybe they're not assessing it as high as, I don't know what they're assessing it at, but that's my question. Is, is, is the cost to the taxpayer to have all of the assessors contracting with a private company in your mind worth, I know you're going to say yes it is, worth what we are already getting from the Department of Revenue that's you know, costing the taxpayer much, much less um, with what it's going to be costing them now in the future by allowing assessors to have home rule on this. Mr. Chairman, um, members of the committee, very good question. I have a contract with this company already. It's been in force since before I came on board in 1999. They already appraised 70 facilities in my county besides the wind farms at a significant value. And we do that because they have the expertise to do this uniformly, equitably, and fairly to all the taxpayers in my county. I have the expertise to do uh, the, the residentials, the commercials, and I've went to the classes, the same classes as the Department of Revenue staff has went to, some of those uh, uh, tea garden, public utility classes, I've been there. I don't do them on a daily basis because the Department of Revenue has been doing them as in specific to the independent power producers. We felt it prudent to get the best that we could get to be the fairest to everybody and to keep the consistency across county lines so there wasn't 23 assessors doing 23 different things. So we made a concerted effort and every one of these counties already had a contract with this company. So it wasn't that we were out searching for a brand new company and a brand new contract. We just put addendums. In my case, my contract was already up. So it was a matter of negotiating a fee to include these, but maybe remove something else. And I'm sure Sweetwater and some of the other counties are very similar. What the actual dollar amounts we do have, but and I can and I can give you what we're paying, but it's not strictly just for these independent power producers. Do I believe it's prudent? Absolutely. Do I think I'm spending the money wisely? Absolutely. Uh, I spend a lot more money than that doing aero photography, and there is nobody wanting me to get rid of my aero photography in my county. So, <laughs> there, yeah, there, there could be, but as we get technology and we use it, that's, that's what we're trying to do, sir. So I hope I answered your question. You did. Other yeah. questions? Senator Case. Um, Mr. Chairman, we, we might ask about the track record on this company. I mean, certainly, Ms. Huxtable, you've had to work with this company for a long time. They've evaluated a lot of industrial facilities. And uh, I assume there have been appeals over that time. And some have gone one way and some have gone the other way. But um, has that experience been over time? And I might ask you, too, are appeals a healthy thing, kind of in the grand scheme of things? And why haven't we seen many appeals in the independent power producer area? I'll throw them out to you if you Mr. can. Mr. Chairman, uh, Cinder Case. Um, so I'm gonna start with the, the appeal side of it first. Um, the appeal that was referenced before was actually my county. So I have a little bit of, of knowledge about that particular case. Um, appeals are always healthy. That means we have active taxpayers paying attention to what we're doing and we wanna be transparent. So in our, my opinion, the appeals are always good. Now, 3,000 appeals may not be so good, but if we can have <laughs> appeals on, on every level, that's a, that's a good thing. Um, the appeal you mentioned in this industry specifically uh, was docketed at the state board level, but it was never heard at the state board level. It was dismissed. They, they settled. I think that's the appropriate legal term. Uh, they settled out uh, for a variety of reasons. I would state that the value that was assessed that year and the taxes that were um, assessed were very close to what was in the industrial siting permit application as to what they anticipated paying. At the end of that appeal, the taxes were reversed to 50%. And it has stayed down there since then. Um, that's one of those companies that I referred to that, were, that their estimated taxes did not 
line up anywhere near shape what they actually paid. Um, and your first question, Senator Case? Well, I guess the first question was really with regard to this contractor okay. and when they assess an industrial property and it goes to appeal. Um, I'm sure it cuts both ways, but... but uh, um, Apologize. Uh, when you said appeal, that usually always gets my attention when I heard the word appeal, yeah. I, I ch get shook up. Um, TY Pickett is the company that we have contracted with, and I think that's a public known name, mm -hmm. so it's not a secret. Um, they appraise, as I said, 70 facilities in my county, and we have had appeals nearly every year for the last five years of those industrial companies. Um, some go on to the state board, some do not. Normally what happens, and this is true of almost every appeal, whether it's industrial or residential, the appeal gets settled, for lack of a better word, because we get better information. We have an opportunity to sit down with the taxpayer and go through that information and have good conversation, and we get the value where it should be or where it's acceptable for both sides. So the track record for TY Pickett for me has been very good. They just finished an appeal in another county that was very very industrial, very complex. Um, we'll see if it goes further. Uh, uh, they were affirmed at the local level. What will happen on up, I don't know. But as far as I know, the track record has been very good with them, both in our state and other jurisdictions, because we did check that out. There is another company that does independent wind farms. So we did do our due diligence to, to look at them, and this was the best one the association felt was in our best interest. And Mr. Chairman? I think we should all take note of the fact that these appeals are very healthy and that they lead to more information and better outcomes. And uh, I really appreciate you, Assessor Huxtable, for saying that. Do you have the same recollection uh, as I do about the, the previous appeal that I mentioned? When I read the settlement, it looked like the state had made two just really big errors because the company had reported turbines uh, in what's called construction work in progress, meaning they had costs associated with turbines, but the turbines weren't even in Wyoming. And Wyoming overcounted the number of turbines. The second point was in, in the cost and data su supplied by the company, they had put in money for reclamation way down the road, and the state was assuming that that was part of the valuation and, and the settlement that was thrown out. Those were the only two issues that were the subject of the appeal, which kind of looked like the settlement and the state said, even Director Schmidt at the time said, we got more information now and this is a, a better outcome. So would you agree with all that? I mean, is your recollection Chairman, the same as me uh, on that? Case, yes, it is. I would, I would caution any of my statements in the fact that that was a state assessed. So right. I was not- You weren't a, a party. A part of it. We did have, the county did have an, uh, an attorney involved in that as uh, representing our interests. And I do know that the AG notified them that it was going to be settled because of information through the Department of Revenue, through the discovery phase. Uh, they didn't want to take it any further and it was going to be settled. And that's as far as I can, everything else would just be hearsay on my part because I was not part of it. Fair enough. There was a newspaper article, Mr. Chairman, on that point that covered those two issues. Ms. Huxville, as healthy as appeals are, it is fair to say they cost time and money and resources all in taxpayers dime would that be correct that would be correct i okay. would concur with representative air thank you mr chairman uh flexible can you give me some kind of a sense as to the magnitude of the change in your third party contract amount due to this independent power producer issue you say that you've been paying them for several years and you have other properties besides the independent power producers that they give you the assessment for so what's the change or just in general how much of an increase did you see because of the addition of the independent power producers um mr chairman um representative Auer, i i can't give you an exact amount because that we had a renewal of a contract and some facilities went away and some came on i have five independent power producers uh, in my county, and roughly probably about 4,000 per facility, but I can't associate that directly because there was other things mixed in there. Um, I will tell you that if you, in my county where these wind farms are located, if, you know, you, we always go back and look at the contract and say, 
what did we recover in in revenue because of what we spent in in taxpayer dollars and that is true specifically with our imagery we just talked about the imagery and we have a change fire and we do all that so i did the math just out of curiosity on what we are spending in the increased contract which truly is not just independent power producers but it would it would roughly be about um to translate that into tax would be about a three million dollar market value adjustment if if the difference in value went up three million that would basically equate the taxes out so um i just was curious to see what it would be and that's what it was just a quick follow-up uh i mean more than dollar amounts i would like to see a percentage amount because the dollars i have no clue what the what proportion that would be of your total bill now i apologize i don't have the total amount because i just did this supplement and we just did the supplemental um well, just in general would you say it was 50 percent 20 percent probably between 30 to 40 percent is okay. what i was going to say because we have a lot of facilities already so uh, thank you mr chairman this question is for the sweetwater county assessor so the i, I want to make sure i have this straight because it sounds pretty strange so what was represented that your tax revenue was going to be from this wind farm was roughly 17 million came in about 3 million did, so so when I was younger, I spent quite a little time trying to stay ahead of the Converse County Assessor on some real estate, and it never really worked that well. But uh, <laughs> has somebody sat down and done a, like a back of an envelope estimate? Because those are sort of a that's that's not a, if you if you're within a couple percent, if you're within twenty five percent, I can see those errors. But uh, if we had somebody say, oh. Maybe this is closer to 13, maybe it's closer to three. Is, do you have that sort of a thing? Or are you willing to testify that here, I guess? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Clausen, um, the planning and zoning uh, documents that were presented, and, and I understand you, you can label them dog and pony shows if you want, estimates, whatever they were. It was very well put together. It was a very nice presentation. And when they got to the point where the property taxes were at, they estimated $17 million over the life of the project. So for the 30 year life of that facility, they estimate, estimated Sweetwater County would collect 17 million. After three years worth of data and extrapolating that out with the same depreciation factor that they claimed, and actually we did see from the department's valuation, the, the information that I've done, um, the number is gonna be closer to four. So you're exactly right, it is 25%, right? Almost 25% of what they had anticipated. But again, I can't see the numbers because I'm I'm not the, the appraisal with the department is confidential to the taxpayer. I mean, and you just kind of chalk it up to experience, I guess, in that situation. And the next time something like this happens and they go in front of the county commissioners, that's will be something I have a conversation with that board about is, you know, OK, this is what happened in the last one. So we need to make sure that in this next um, this next project that we do get we need to ask better questions and hope for better answers. And again, not faulting anybody. Don't know what happened. Again, don't know where the numbers came from and don't know where don't have access to the appraisal, but it looks awful funny. I agree with you completely. And this is not this is the first solar facility in Wyoming, but it certainly won't be the last. So we want to make sure we ask good questions. Mr. Chairman, thank you. If you had access to the appraisal and just like with an appeal, the parties have an opportunity to learn additional information that you know, resolves the concern or the dispute, would you still feel the way that you do uh, about resisting the Department of Revenue from taking over and continuing to do these? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator, I would still resist that. I mean, my association has voted against this legislation. So I, and personally, I would as well. I think we, we have the tools to do the appraisal. We have an independent firm that does this valuation process for us. I trust their judgment, and I think they can get us a very good value on these properties. Do you trust the judgment of the Department of Revenue? I do. I absolutely do. So I think ultimately what many of us are struggling with, is it 50-50? Is it philosophical that you believe you really should be able to assess these, or is it this concern that the department is not fully assessing what you believe some of these facilities should be assessed at? I assume it's some mix there, um, but I never heard that the assessors went to the Department of Revenue and asked for this. 
it was from what I understood and correct me if I'm wrong, the Department of Revenue was reviewing their statutes and said, we might not have authority here. Let's just go to the legislature and get that authority. And then um, the conversation went the other way, perhaps on, we're not going to give you the authority. It really is a, a local thing. So can you kind of explore that a little bit with me? Do we think they're undervalued or is this really, I don't want to call it a turf war, but I think that's what we're struggling with as a legislature. Mm -hmm. Where are we on this kind of, is it a philosophical or is it they're undervaluing it and we're concerned? Um, Mr. Mr. Chairman, so a little bit of both. You're absolutely correct. So the initial question is how were they being valued? Were they being valued properly? And we could not answer that question. Mr. Mr. Chairman, thank you. You couldn't answer that question because the information is confidential and so you can't get it. But you can get the ultimate numbers and assessments. And so since you've been in your position for about 23 years, is it your just off the cuff judgment that it was way below value as Sweetwater County believes theirs was based on what was presented to them at the time the project was approved of an estimated value of 17 million over 30 years as opposed to the anticipated four. So what is it that's giving you that information that that it is the numbers are potentially inaccurate if in fact you do trust the judgment of the Department of Revenue. Um, Mr. Chairman, Senator Delcott, it's because of these questions that that's caused the concern. I started looking for public accessible data because I couldn't get it. I did go to the department. I did ask some questions and they were not able to answer them to the confidentiality. So I went looking, where can I find this information? Is it is the numbers, I had no reason to doubt it from the time these wind farms came in, they were state assessed. I did not question that. I presume that's where they should be. Truthfully, I did not go to them asking for this, but when the question came up, is the value where it should be? I started looking. What did the taxpayer say when they came to my county with the industrial siding permit? What were they estimating? What's out there for public information for the public to, to know? And I started comparing it, and all of a sudden the numbers didn't jive. They don't match. I went back to the department, asked, and they weren't able to answer those questions. So I trust the department, whether they're not getting enough information, whether they're doing it all perfectly, and the industrial siting permits where these taxpayers are telling us what they're bringing to our communities is wrong. That could absolutely be the truth. But as an elected official for my county, I feel like I need to be informed. I need to know which way it is, because I do have some permits coming my way in the next six months. I need to know, do I need to question those things? Are they not telling us the truth about what they're gonna provide for us? Or do we need to take a look at the values and see if the information they're giving the department is not correct? Mr. Chairman, um, quick follow-up. Quick follow-up and then we'll go to Duncan. What was your question? Think, have, have you um, asked your contractor their off-the-cuff opinion about your concerns? I'm sorry. Have you asked your contractor about their off-the-cuff opinion regarding your concerns? The, the company you contract the, with the that's in all these other states that assesses wind farms could probably tell you just by looking at it. Yeah, this many, this much property, this is how much they have, here's what we would do in other states. Does that conform? To um, so, Mr. Chairman, Senator Nethercourt, absolutely I have asked them. When these questions came up, I went to that company and went to their expert to see. The question became, how does Wyoming tax them? How are they, are they taxed based off the nameplate? Are they, is, is there a formula within the statutes? We don't have that. So they had to dig, dig deeper and they gave me, actually the contractor I have gave me a copy of an appraisal from another state with everything redacted, names, et cetera. So I could see how they did it. And it's very similar to what the department did as much as I could tell, I got a, a model from the Department of Revenue, I got the annual report, and they said, plug these numbers in, and you should come up with what we got. I couldn't come up with that. There is an appraiser judgment that's a part of every appraiser, appraisal in the world, and that's their right to put that, but they couldn't tell me where they got it. The third party contractor showed me, here's the list of how we will do it, and this is what we would do, and they're not the same. They may come up with the same answer, but the process they're going to go through is going to be a little different. And I'm just one more. Do you, you want to break for a minute? Go ahead. No, no, uh, and forgive me for not knowing this, but do you have the ability to appeal with the county? And did you? 
not in this situation. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman Go and ahead. Senator. No, we do not. Not not these properties because we didn't value them. The taxpayer could appeal the value of the department said, but we have no ability to appeal these. Right. And they have not had one mm -hmm. since in 10 years from more than 10. Okay. Representative Duncan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I kind of have a couple questions. The first one is can you ask the company about the appraisal? Well, I suppose you go ahead. You could ask, but they wouldn't have to tell you. Is that correct? Uh, Chairman Zwanser, uh, Representative Duncan, I believe I could ask. The, uh, have I asked them about the appraisal? To be honest, no, I have not. Um, I ask for the annual reports for the last three or four years I've gotten the annual report so that I could get historical data and try to follow along to see what I'm missing. What is it that's that's making this imbalance out there? Um, I, I don't see that the department's doing anything wrong and please understand that wholeheartedly. I don't know if it's the data that's being given to them. I don't know where the inequity is and maybe it is solely on the taxpayer that's giving us false, false information from the front. I really don't know. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So it, I know commercial versus, you know, residential such are complete in an industrial, completely different. So I'm trying to wrap my brain around. How, isn't this an, is there any incident where it's similar where you would have um, in a case with a residential differentiation versus an industrial differentiation because an appraisal is bought and paid for by the private company or the private you know seller or owner the property right the property owner so do you ever see in any other of the industries this vast difference or change as well besides just this like this particular in case and scenario do you see it anywhere else and all the other valuations or any of the other um, properties and, and, and different situations. Mr. Chairman, Representative Duncan, yes, we do. So in when you have a residential or a commercial appeal, it's very common to have fee appraisals brought in in the evidentiary process of that appeal hearing. And you will see an appeal uh, of our value based on a fee appraisal the taxpayer had done for whatever purpose they did. And sometimes they're very different. And then we have to look at uh, the purpose of the, of the appraisal, uh, what kind of uh, data they used, was it comparable to what we did? We remember in, in all of ours, we are mass appraisal where the fee appraisal is going out and picking the three best properties or five. So yes, we see those fee appraisals all the time and we do talk about them and we do discuss them in the, in the appeal hearing. Um, but in this particular case, uh, the appraisal is done by the Department of Revenue for the taxpayer. That's the two people that, that have access to that appraisal. When you're talking about your, your property, probably the taxpayer didn't have the appraisal done, probably the finance company did. In most cases, we find out that when they got the mortgage, the bank had it and then gives it to the taxpayer and there's a disclaimer on it that it's for the purpose of this, this, and this. And so that's always a vital part of the information that we use, but it's up to the taxpayer to give it to us. We can't ask for it. All right, other questions for the assessors? Not seeing any quite yet, okay. I bet we'll have some. We'll be around. Okay, thanks. Other people testify on the bill, Mr. Muneer. former chairman of the Public Service Commission and the Board of Equalization. One of the smartest people I know. Welcome. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you just saved me introducing myself. Um, I got into this, I had developed an interest in this issue because I live in a part of Albany, I have a second house in a part of Albany County where there's gonna be a large wind farm, the Real Tie Wind Project. The Rail Tie Wind Project, as part of their application, submitted to the county an estimate of what property taxes they would be paying. Are you with me so far? 
I could look at the estimate that the, the, they say that that project will last for 35 years. But when you look at their schedule for depreciation, the depreciation, they depreciate it pretty much to basis after 25 years. So that for the last 10 years of the project, there's minimal assessment of that massive project. This is a project that's three times the size of the city of Laramie. It's 26,000 acres, 600 foot windmills. They're talking 35 years because those kinds of lives are what happen when you get massive windmills as opposed to the ones you see south of town. Okay, when I looked at that, um, having been on the Public Service Commission as well as the State Board of Equalization, I thought, if this was a Pacific Corp project, they wouldn't be able to depreciate it over 25 years. Where did that number come from? Over the course of the last year, to make a long story short, I found out eventually that it came from the policies of the Department of Revenue, which apparently has been advising wind companies that that's the kind of number they should be using. Now, this is not to say the Department of Revenue can't evolve, but consider this. First of all, if they were a regulated utility, they wouldn't be estimating their depreciation on that basis. No, no way, because there are rules about what kind of depreciation you do. And if you're a regulated utility, if its life is 35 years, you're gonna get a straight line depreciation for 35 years. Which leads to a different sort of question. If you are an independent power producer and you are not a regulated utility and you don't have anybody else looking at this. So think about what happens with pipelines or regulated utilities. There's all kinds of people, federal and state, looking at the numbers that are being prepared and submitted by these entities. Not true of independent power producers. So what happens? One of the things that concerns me is, first, the company could actually, arguably in good faith, because they thought they'd gotten a cue from the Department of Revenue, submit a depreciation number without explaining where they got it from that provided for the acceler accelerated depreciation that Pacific Corp would never get if it were doing the same thing, okay? Now, how is the state gonna know that they're not? <clears throat> and in fact, one of the things that concerns me is the state relies fairly heavily on the fact that this is a, a state which uh, basically rests on taxpayer reported information. They don't pick at it very much. So during the course of the last year, um, frustrated as I am, as the assessors are, about getting a real understanding about how the appraisal judgment of the relatively number, limited number of staff people in the state has been exercised, my conclusion is that what is really needed here is the same kind of is transparency, although not the same kind of transparency that the Taxpayers Association went, was, was talking about. We need, really need to understand with these facilities how the numbers are being used to reach the same, the, the right conclusion. I feel at this point the, the assessors are a better bet, partly because there's going to be more boots on the ground. And partly because I think that the independent power producers are much more analogous to the mining facilities and the refinery facilities than they are to the other regulated utilities who have a whole raft of watchdogs looking over their shoulders to make sure that their numbers are consistent. What concerns me, I guess, at another deeper, deeper level is, I know that Senator Case and Senator Scott would remember years ago when we had a long period this is sort of about the time that I was on the Board of Equalization, when the oil and gas industry was reporting one set of numbers to the counties and one set of numbers to the state. Um, and I think that the best way to get to consistency now is at the very least to give the counties a shot at doing these appraisals. If after one year, or two years of letting the counties do it, again, because they have boots in the ground, uh, they have the same guiding principles that the state does, we find out that that was a bad idea, then fine. 
But I, I can guarantee you that even though I personally will not know more about how appraisal judgment was exercised, I'm pretty damn sure that I'm going to feel a lot more comfortable about the number of assessors wrestling with this and T.Y. Pickett, who's the name of the company. I'm, I'm confident in what the, the work they do since I saw a lot of it over time. I think that's the way to go for the time being. I think it would lay a lot of things to rest, at least in my mind, that I think are otherwise imponderable because of the way the system is operating now. So that's why I'm here in front of you today. I honestly, I, I'm not here to, uh, I think Brent is a terrific director. I know I'm very, uh, I think her skills are terrific, but the system is not working right at this point, by my estimation. And there, there are ways that I can see it go wrong. And there are no checks on the valuations of independent power producers that I see with regard to regulated utilities. So that's the position that I have, and I hope I can have explained it well enough and, sh and quickly enough so that you're all still <laughs> awake. Questions for Chairman Manier, former Chairman Manier, and Representative Clausen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, so I, I there's a lot of wind activity in my county, and uh, with your experience on the Public Service Commission, maybe there there is actually a way we can do a back of an envelope evaluation on whether these things are close or not. So we have a wind farm that is half regulated utility and half independent power producer. Is there a route that you could go through through the Public Service Commission to make sure those numbers balance up? Um, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, um, Representative, um, I don't know, actually, now I think about it. Um, all this stuff that I actually know in detail was confidential, so I can't tell you. I'm kind of, <laughs> one of the other problems here is that, is that if Renda were to tell me what they actually did, she'd probably have to kill me, that kind of thing. Um, so I really, I really can't tell you. I don't think there's a simple way to do that. I, I think that, that you've really got to give, and also the other difficulty is that um, some of the, the arrangement, the financial arrangements that the companies enter into wind up doing from some fairly spectacularly strange things with regard to production tax credits. So ultimately, if you're Pacific Corp, for example, you really, since you're owned by Warren Buffett, um, Warren Buffett owns Geico Insurance. Okay, so it throws off a lot of cash, piles of cash that theoretically Warren Buffett would have to pay tax on. If Warren Buffett can consolidate his tax return, which he can, and has a lot of production tax credits, which you can get by being in the wind industry right now, it really makes sense for him to be in that industry. In fact, I think he said as recently as seven years ago that basically the government is paying him to build wind facilities because it's that lucrative for them from a tax perspective. That's part of the reason that I think um, this whole area requires as, as much as more as much perspective from as many people as possible as we can get to get to the right answer. And that's why I think it'd be good for the assessors. More boots on the ground, more eyes on the problem. And again, maybe after a couple of years, um, we could go back uh, and feel that feel comfortable going back. But right now, I, I think that that's the way to go. So I, I, can't, I can't tell you how to, exactly how I'd do that. And I'm not sure that, that the Public Service Commission people wouldn't have to kill the Board of Equalization people to do the same thing. You know, it's kind of, the, these, part, it, these cylinders of confidentiality make it very difficult uh, to figure out a workable solution. Follow up, Reverend Clausen. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, forget I asked the question. If that's All right, thank you very much, I Mr. Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Senator Case, question for Mr. Muneer. Yeah, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Muneer, thanks a lot for being here. I, I don't think that uh, anybody is more uniquely qualified having served as chairman of the Public Service Commission and chairman of the Board of Equalization. I mean, it's just kind of an astounding combination. So can you help us all again with why utilities are different and maybe mention was made of the unitary approach and and uh, for valuing any type of utility plant so the way i think of it and help me out if a utility has a total amount of investment in the state that, that total amount is the unitary value and then that has to be apportioned between all the counties based on i assume customers or sales or whatever they use um, 
and the facilities like in generation facilities like a solar farm or a wind farm are just a tiny part of that unitary valuation um, and this is where you know when when these witnesses earlier were saying we need to treat I, ipps the same as utilities i'm going crazy because it's two different methods to begin with can you help explain that better than maybe i have uh, probably not better than you have, but I'll give it a shot, Mr. Chairman. Yep. Um, I think the idea is that the unitary valuation method winds up being aggregated from a whole raft of things that no one person could ever comprehend. But one of the things they do know about it is that when you um, deal with the numbers of public utilities, particularly the ones that do business in this state, um, we do uh, depreciation hearings periodically, sometimes every five years. And I do know that you get a depreciation number that is not based on accelerated depreciation. So that's really the main thing that I know that I can bring to this problem. How you aggregate that all back up into um, the unitary method, I think you need somebody that does that all the time, and I don't. In fact, I've been trying to forget that ever since I retired in 2017. <laughs> But, Mr. Chairman, it would be fair to say they're very different methods. Very different. I mean, that's not very different. No, it, but it, that's, that's kind of like, it's really kind of an intimate thing, yeah. I would say. The relationship between the uh, IPPs and the State Department of Revenue and Taxation is an intimate arrangement. That is, they both know what they're doing, and none of the rest of us really do. <clears throat> I would say that when you get to Pacific Corp, it's not intimate at all. There's all kinds of fingers in it everywhere and every direction, six ways from Sunday, um, assuring that what they're doing is consistent and represents a value on which you can both tax and set rates. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Other questions from Mr. Muneer? Seeing none out, thank you. Thank, thank you. Very much. May I be excused? I have two dogs that are really Certainly can. pissed off that I have not been talking <laughs> Thanks, a lot Thanks for staying with us. Thank you. Uh, I think the county commissioners are going to come first. Welcome, Mr. Raymond. Happy to wait. Nope. Uh, actually, Commissioner Espy, I think, uh, is online. So is Commissioner Willicks. We invited them both in. So Perfect. I assume they're planning on joining you for this part, and it's coordinated. So go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Jeremiah Raymond here on behalf of the Wyoming County Commissioners Association. I'm not going to offer an opinion on uh, support or op opposition to the bill, but you have a few things to offer and then I've got some commissioners here. I thought it might be helpful given some of the questioning to give a little bit of history of how we got to this particular conversation. This issue came to my attention a few years ago as, as commissioners, as assessors were trying to reconcile these differences uh, that they were uh, looking at. Uh, and at the time uh, we all went to uh, Title 39, 13102, Q, Romanet 2. And in that, it uh, provides that without written authorization uh, of the taxpayer, then the department cannot disclose this information uh, 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 with a few exceptions. One of those exceptions is in B, and that says upon prior notice to the taxpayer, not written uh, authorization. It just says notice uh, to the taxpayer that it can be uh, released to uh, uh, other governmental entities uh, or political subdivisions of the state um, uh, upon uh, sufficient uh, reason to obtain the information for official business. At the time, the department was, uh, and this is under a different director, uh, was denying those authorizations. You know, how could we prove the official business that was going to be that this information would, was going to be uh, used for as part of that you also, also have to think and i think that uh, senator nethercott was getting to this even if we had that information all we could do is perhaps cry foul uh, we had no appeal process uh, in that where we would have no standing uh, in that conversation so Moving forward in 2021, uh, Senate File 69 came forward, and that was an attempt to try and address, uh, at least giving authorization for 
uh, access to the information. Unfortunately, that legislation uh, did not move for a lot of reasons, including opposition from many parties uh, around uh, allowing that. And it, it was well beyond the industry that's in this room. It was a much big, bigger issue. Uh, that conversation then generated, we had a change in director over time, and that generated a reanalysis of this issue, which then resulted in this notion that perhaps the state shouldn't uh, or had no authority to be actually analyzing this. And that included not only the department, but also the attorney general's office of looking at that particular issue. So we got to today. Bill was moved last year. It didn't move. My members uh, have authorized moving forward uh, with the work that needs to be done, the work that counties are going to be responsible for undertaking. They've entered into new contracts. Uh, the assessors talked about those contracts. I've tried to to gather information about the fiscal impact uh, that that will have. And this is going to happen regardless of whether you change uh, this. Uh, it, it's roughly in the range of about sixty to $100,000 total uh, across the state. And there are, I believe, seven counties that uh, are involved in this, all of varying sizes of, of uh, uh, impacts. So uh, getting to the amendment that's been proposed, if that is adopted, you know, obviously you heard from Assessor Huxable, we're going to have this uh, issue of, of uh, perhaps competing uh, analysis that are going to take place uh, and what's that going to cause. So it's an administrative uh, heartache and then frustration from my members who have expended monies uh, to put forward. So frankly, I would ask for your consideration of an appropriation to reimburse counties if this is the direction that you want to go with that. Again, we don't have an opinion on the bill other than that one particular piece. Um, that said, I do have some commissioners that do have some strong feelings uh, on this particular issue. Uh, on both sides, I offered uh, the opportunity for, for all of them to uh, participate. A couple of them could. Those uh, gentlemen are on. Uh, one is uh, our board president, uh, Mr. Jim Willicks uh, from Converse County. Another uh, is Mr. John Espy uh, from Carver County. And I'd appreciate uh, if you could offer them some time to offer their perspectives. All right, let's go to Mr. Espy first, just because his camera is on first. John, welcome. Floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. John Espy, Carbon County, Wyoming. Um, I, I'd like to see, just I'm going to be blunt, see this bill laid to bed. Um, and I'm going to uh, go through real quick on one wind facility independent power producer in our county in 2020 it was valued at 1.5 million 2021 1.8 million <clears throat> 2022 433,000 you know how how does it drop by two-thirds in in one year um, as far as using the contractor uh, we use the contractor. We have two guest ranches in the county. And when we switched to using the contractor, the revenue that we brought back in from having that expertise paid for that contractor plus. Uh, you know, and just, just on our 12 mills more than covered it. But I think we also got to look, you know, if we're not valuing these right, these independent power producers right, it's not only the, the counties, but it's the schools, it's the special districts, it's the conservation districts that that all gonna suffer if if we're not valuing these right. Is our economies changing from the mineral extraction to more of the renewables? The BLM has a plan to get what 25 gig put on uh, federal land in the next 10 years. We're going to be seeing more of this come, and we've got to make sure that they're paying their fair share to the people of Wyoming because we have to provide those services to them. Um, and I'd also agree. Um, back when I was in college, I did take a class on how public regulated utilities how they're taxed different and how they're handled different. So really, the methodology of uh, assessing a regulated public utility versus an independent power producer should be two different methodologies. And 
um, in Carbon County offered to have a contractor go in and value all the wind facilities in Carbon County at our cost to hand that over to the Department of Revenue. And the Department of Revenue turned our offer down. And I'm just, I think the counties are the ones that have the expertise where we're gonna have, we already have boots on the ground in Carbon County out doing it. And we're gonna get the actual values on these. Uh, Self-reporting is not a good thing for somebody that can't be looking over their shoulder. And I'll kind of close, you know, our nation was kind of founded on this, trying to get out of taxation. We started with the Tea Party and, you know, moved on to the Whiskey Rebellion. And it, it, that's been our culture in this country. As elected officials, it's part of our job to make sure that the industries that are coming to our counties are paying their fair share for what they do take from our counties. And with that, I'd stand for any questions. Questions for Commissioner Espy. Carbon County, Wind Capital of Wyoming. Okay, Mr. Willicks, you're up next. Floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I might think Converse County is the wind capital until they get their project finished, but a debate for another day. Thank you for letting me join uh, via remotely. You know, I would fully agree with the assessor's testimony earlier, uh, but I want to make a point. I come here as a friend of wind. We are an all of the above county in Converse County. We welcome the development we've had. And I consider myself a friend of wind, and I've had discussions with the representatives in the room about this issue. We may reach a disagreement on the issue, but I want to say that I'm a friend of wind and I want more development of that in our state. I agree with the Taxpayers Association that the taxes should be fair and equitable. I am not convinced we have reached that point with wind. It is a developing industry in Wyoming. Really, the last 10 years is when we've only had significant development. We dabbled in it before that. And I'm not convinced we've got there yet. And, and I'll say I'm not convinced the Department of Revenue quite has it figured out either. And not a knock, it's an evolving industry and solar will be the next evolving industry in Wyoming. We've got oil and gas figured out. We do a pretty darn good job with that. And I would, the, the thing that concerns me the most has been alluded to, and it's a problem on, with two sides of the coin, is the numbers presented in the industrial siting process about estimated tax payments are not matching. Um, and that is concerning because the industry is telling us what they think they're going to pay. They've done the math. Uh, and there are reasons it changes a little bit. The, the project changes in design a little bit. Mills change a little bit. But even when you factor that in, I don't think we account for the differences we're seeing. We already assess everything that's above the ground. And I, that's a simplified statement, but the assessors referred to it. And these are above the ground. Uh, minerals, pipelines, and then you heard the examples of the railroads and others. So it is definitely within our wheelhouse. And I think it would be consistent in policy. And I think it would be consistent in philosophically to have local assessment of independent power producers. As you've heard, they are not the same as regulated utilities, not even close. We've made the choice in the past to change where we assess from local to state. Uh, and I, you know, that, or from vice versa. And I think it's important that we recognize that should not be a burden. Um, the question was asked uh, about the, you know, the expending the money from you, Mr. Chairman. And when the assessor came to us about expanding the contract because the state law required us to do it, we thought it was money well spent. My hope is these assessments will come in within five to 10% of what the state is doing. That's, that's showing that we are on the right track. That's what I really hope. If it comes in more than that, then we have to have a bigger discussion about self-reporting, methodology, appraisals, depreciation, all those things that were alluded to. I really hope we come in close and that'll say, we're doing it right. Uh, but I'm not convinced we've got there yet because of the evolving industry. And then the only, dis and we get more information with time. And I think why this issue has come, we started with state assessment because that was the assumption, but we've also gotten more information over time that leads us to, ask the questions that were brought forward. I do want to clarify one thing just for the record. Jeremiah did introduce me as the president of the association. I am speaking on behalf of Converse County. Our board is behind uh, the local assessment and not in favor of this bill. Uh, the statewide commissioners have not taken a formal position as Jeremiah indicated. 
We've discussed it, but really the seven counties uh, are, are the only ones affected. If the bill moves forward further, we will, of course, uh, vote on it, but we just have it. So I did want to clarify that I'm not speaking on behalf of the association, but on behalf of Congress County, and we would be glad to answer any questions any way we have. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Questions from Commissioner Willicks? Seeing none. Thank you very much, Jim, for being here. Thank you very much. Uh, Jeremiah, back to you. Nothing? Question, Senator Nethercott? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and Mr. Reedman was correct in where I was going with my line of questioning as a potential solution here that would maybe theoretically make everybody happy, uh, which is one, to address the new policy of the new director of the Department of Revenue concerning doing what is currently statutorily authorized, which is providing those appraisals to county assessors. And if you want some type of non-disclosure agreement or additional confidentiality protections, you certainly have the authority to enter into those with the county assessors, but it is lawful to turn them over. So says my legal opinion, but I think it's pretty good. Uh, so I'd like to know that, and if we need to provide further statutory um, clarity, as to that issue to ensure that that can in fact happen in the future, because uh, I do think that that's important. Um, and then secondarily, to give counties standing as appellees in challenging any of these determinations if the Department of Revenue continues to do them. I guess that's a question. Um, and let me pile on, is it fair to have one level of government being able to yes. ask the question to another level of government over a tax evaluation right. that chairman's monitor yep. yes i do think so i think that the county assessors are elected by their people and are acting on behalf of them in the same way that we challenge other areas of government and i don't think that it's necessarily improper it's to get the truth as right. under case would identify Thoughts on that as chairman of the County Commission Association, how you interact with other levels of government and. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll offer a couple of things. You know, first off, in terms of our ability to get to a position on this, it's getting into the weeds a little bit, but we have a 70% <laughs> threshold for of commissioners across the state to establish a position on a bill. Uh, and we've not been able to do that with this particular legislation. You've heard from a couple of commissioners that uh, are uh, opposed to this. I have a couple that are, uh, uh, you know, supportive of of the concept of uh, state assessment, and then I have a whole lot that are ambivalent. This is just not their issue. They, you know, we've got, as I said, seven counties that have uh, these facilities in in their jurisdiction right now. Yeah. That said, to what Senator Nethercott is is uh, mentioning, we have been supportive of providing additional clarity around uh, the confidentiality, the disclosure of this information in the past. And, and so I suspect we would be wholeheartedly in support of uh, ensuring that uh, assessors in particular could get access to the information. I don't know that I can offer an opinion without going back to, to the uh, commissioners around whether then there would be an appeal to that, but it seems to me you know, what do you do with the information uh, if you have it? Uh, either you have the PO process, or again, we're just going to complain to you that uh, uh, that there's something wrong in the system. And and uh, I hope we could find a better system than that. Go ahead, Senator Nethercutt. And Mr. Chairman, thank you. And I, and I would imagine that it would likely be resolved without the necessity of any kind of further formal appeal action. Um, with a further comparing of, of, of necessary data of appraisals or whatever it might be. It sounds like that's a relationship that occurs now with mutual trust amongst um, both, both levels of government. Um, so the challenge right now is somewhat perplexing to me and I think more easily resolved than we're giving it credit. And if I can, Mr. Chairman, to, to what Senator other Cots uh, speaking of, I, I can say, yes, things are working well right now, and there's a level of trust with the current uh, administration at the department. I can't say that existed necessarily with the, the previous administration on this particular issue. So that got us into some of this conversation. 
other issues, yeah, we worked together very well on this was one that uh, didn't go so well. well Mr. Chairman, um, I, I can't avoid pointing out that this ground has been plowed in the Revenue Committee and, you know, a, a lot of time. And that we did have a bill. Um, it's a, uh, sorry, it's a 2021 bill about confidentiality of state assessed property and sharing it with the assessors. Um, I assure you, uh, the mineral industry and every other person that has state assessed, they don't want that confidentiality breached. They, they really don't. And they probably have a legitimate issue in that case. Um, we had wheedled that down to just be these types of facilities. And, but that, uh, I believe that leadership in the Senate didn't want to hear that bill. And so, uh, but it, so we did try that route. Um, the one problem is you, you and you have a, a decent idea, the uh, allowing appeals and be able to use the information is useful, definitely useful. The previous efforts were just to allow for the, the, the stuff to be shared with assessors. It didn't really mean that the assessors could do anything with it or uh, such as appeal or share it with anybody else. So it was kind of I think uh, Assessor uh, Davis uh, said just sharing the information doesn't accomplish anything for them. So, you know, honestly, this bill is not the vehicle. <laughs> um, we could do another bill. There could be an individual bill to try to tackle these things, but uh, this bill doesn't even solve the, li the litigation potential that could happen when we get done, even if it did pass the legislature. So um, anyway, I th I, it's going late. I you don't see a hot solution. Seat, Jeremiah? Questions for the commissioners? Nope. Save yourself. Other public comment? Welcome. Ms. Shainer, floor is Thank yours. you, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Mary Ann Shainer. I'm here on behalf of NextEra Energy Resources, and I'd like to turn it over to Angela Patelli. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Zvonitzer and Driscoll, for allowing me the opportunity to testify before this <laughs> committee on the um, draft LSO Bill 0127. My name is Angela Patelli. I'm with Multistate Associates, also here representing NextEra Energy, where until recently I oversaw state tax policy on regulatory and political affairs team at NextEra. NextEra is the world's largest wind and solar company. We developed, owned, and operate the 225 megawatt roundhouse wind project in Laramie County, and we developed the 533 megawatt Cedar Springs wind projects in Converse County, of which we still own and operate 333 megawatts. These projects represent over a billion dollars of capital investment in Wyoming, and NextEra plans to bring online 556 megawatts of new wind energy projects by 2024, bringing an additional billion dollars of investment into the state. We're the sixth largest non-minerals property taxpayer in the state in 2022, as we were in 2021, behind only the state's largest utilities, railroads, and pipeline companies, according to recent Department of Revenue reports. Over the expected 30-year lives of these two projects alone, NextEra will pay approximately $255 million in landowner payments and will generate hundreds of million dollars in tax revenue for the state, not just property tax revenue, but other revenues as well. Wyoming's business climate has made this an attractive place for us to do business, and we hope to be able to execute on an additional $4 billion of wind and solar projects in Wyoming in future years. But we need to maintain a stable tax structure in the state that is critical for enabling such future investments. The current process has worked well, providing consistent treatment across the state for all wind farm assessments and avoiding uncertainty for developers and owners. 
Without legislative action, there will be a shift, as we know, from the assessment of these facilities from the state to the county. The shift would result in uncertainty for developers, potential disparate treatment of wind farms from county to county and between different classes of owners. It will be significant and costly disruption to the industry and potentially localities as appeals are likely to result. The allocation of the wind generation tax among counties is also based on relative property tax assessments. That is, the higher the wind farm values in a county, the more wind generation taxes they are allocated from the state. That fact seems to have been largely overlooked, but a change in the relative assessments of wind farms will result in unexpected change in the allocation of the wind generation tax among local jurisdictions, creating winners and losers among counties and potentially incentivizing higher and higher assessments. Failure of the legislator, legislature to act will result in existing and future projects of IPPs being locally assessed, which is a major departure from the way they've been treated historically. For these reasons, we ask the committee to support language that clarifies the statute, maintains the status quo, and ensures that all facilities are treated the same, whether independently or utility owned. And I know we've had many discussions about why they are not the same, but they're, they're still the same. Um, maintaining consistency is important to ensure no disruption in the process and to the industry. Some assessors, and indeed Senator Case, have expressed concerns with the department's assessments and oppose maintaining the status quo, indicating that the valuations must be too low because there's been no litigation or appeals of the assessments. This fact actually indicates that the valuations have been fair and uniform. Indeed, it is rare in our experience, which is all over the country, that valuations, uh, that challenges to state assessments occur and respect, respectfully, it would be surprising for this legislature to act or not act intentionally in order to generate expensive appeals and litigation. Next Era, as well as others in the industry, have experience in many other states with both local and state assessment of wind energy facilities. Valuation protests arise for many legitimate reasons, and reasonable people can disagree on appropriate variables, but in our experience, Protests typically involve local assessments done by third party appraisers. Oklahoma is a great example. It is experiencing very high numbers of protests and litigation related to third party appraisals used in local assessments. And there's been legislation actually in 2022 to address those. And you'll hear more about that, I believe, from another uh, pre presenter. Members of this committee have also heard from assessors that they have concerns about certain projects providing property tax projections that do not align with the department's assessment. While I'm not familiar with the specifics of those particular projects, there are many reasons a projected assessment may be different from what is shown at the time of permitting and what is ultimately assessed. Permitting happens very early in the process of a project while many variables are yet to be determined and usually prior to execution of contracts. Project developers tend to err on the side of caution and conservatism when estimating costs, including taxes, to avoid negative financial surprises during operations. Management gets very unhappy about those kinds of surprises. The difference of a few million dollars of estimated tax revenue is not intended to, nor is it likely to, change the outcome of a permitting decision where hundreds of millions and potentially billions of dollars of investment are in play, representing tens of millions of dollars in tax revenue over a project's 30-year life. In their testimony last interim, some of the local assessors testified that they were simply seeking more transparency into the Department of Revenue's valuation of wind facilities in order to provide an educated response to questions about wind farms from their constituents. While we have concerns about singling out the wind industry for such a provision, along with wanting to ensure confidentiality of sensitive and proprietary information, we, along with other members of the industry, have attempted to address that concern with compromise language that's now been introduced as an amendment or, or posted as an amendment this morning, which would permit full transparency of the department's work product. The assessors have so far rejected all of our attempts to compromise, including coming forward with any suggestions to change the language. We note that there have been no findings of inaccuracies or wrongdoing on the part of the department, 
which has been stated over and over again by the assessors. Thus, we propose that the more prudent course of action is to maintain the status quo, provide the information to the assessors, and address issues if they are, in fact, identified. Nothing in the statute prevents the assessors from asking questions of the Department of Revenue about the information that they receive. They can certainly have conversations. We urge this committee to support the LSO draft bill language, allow all wind facilities to remain state assessed, providing consistency regardless of ownership. Despite the seemingly simple structure of wind facilities, they operate in complex markets and transactions and under complicated contracts, all of which factor into their value, making this complex work that requires skilled expertise and training. Employees at the Department of Revenue have demonstrated this expertise, and they have no incentive to assess property at either a higher or a lower amount than fair market value. This is likely why there have been no appeals. And appeals of state assessments are relatively rare for that because of that fact. On the other hand, third party consultants, which assessors have stated they must hire to perform appraisals if locally assessed, may be incentivized to generate higher assessments as a means to justify their involvement and the cost of hiring them, which has the potential to distort the system, as we have seen in other states. And I'd like to address the point raised by Senator Nethercott about uh, uh, giving rights to the assessors to appeal. Um, I think that is something that I can't speak for the industry as a whole, but certainly my client could not, uh, would not be willing to accept for a number of reasons. First of all, if the assessors had the ability to appeal, the actual taxpayer would be left out of that process. Um, we are concerned about the state having an incentive to defend its assessment since they don't have a financial interest in the outcome. Why would they spend money on attorneys to defend something that they have no real interest in? The compromise language that we've offered goes further to give the assessors rights than any other state already. No other state has, has those kinds of provisions, and certainly no other state gives their assessors appeal rights over a state assessment. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you. Questions for next era. Representative Clausen. Mr. Chairman, so my question, this has always perplexed me to regulate it. We've come sort of full circle in this committee because we were in charge of political subdivisions and the, and the uh, <clears throat> regulated utility, but the relationship between uh, independent power producers and, and the regulated utility. So there's a power purchase agreement. So the under the regulated utility model, the, the rate payer is definitely uh, the taxpayer for for anything that's levied on on any of those facilities and through through the independent power producer the ratepayer is actually the taxpayer in this this model it's just it goes through one more layer when we figure these things for per power purchase agreements i would have to assume that the that the tax burden was figured in for the ratepayer in, in all these calculations so to me, the ratepayer is actually the taxpayer in this on this model, even though it's sort of washed through the independent power producer through through power purchase agreement. So the the gap then becomes the the ratepayer is paying for the paying for the service services to their community in certain certain instances when these taxes are levied. I guess I'm going a long way around the barn, and it's fairly complicated. But a few people that are in the middle of this stuff. But would that be a correct assessment, or am I way out there? Oh, go ahead. Um, I'm not sure I'm clear on the question, but I'll attempt to answer it. Um, okay. So you're correct that independent power producers generally operate under power purchase agreements where we sell power to the utilities to service their load under long-term contracts generally 20 years or is kind of the standard um, those power purchase price power purchase agreement prices are set obviously 
when entering into that contract. So it's based on estimates of what the taxes will be, as well as all of the other costs, and tries to provide us with a rate of return that we expect on our investment. Once we enter into that contract, any changes in law or uh, in, in this case, our tax liability falls on the independent power producer. There's, there's no con contractual way for us to recover that. Unlike a utility, which goes through a weight making process every so often, and if their costs increase, then that gets passed through to the ratepayers. We don't have the ability to do that. That's the reason that consistency is so important to our industry, because we don't have any way to recover those costs once we've entered into those power purchase agreements. Does that answer your question? Well, so, so generally, the, the tax burden is figured in when you do contracts for a power purchase, and the ratepayer is actually paying the taxes through these arrangements, and it's just it just works out in the end. If something would change, you'd have to go back and adjust that contract, or or you or the utility would be sort of out of it. But uh, it's all figured in in front, and then if there it was avoided in between, that could be figured as profit for the independent power producer. Uh, Chairman uh, Representative Clausen, um, we can't go back and adjust the contracts. We, we eat that if, if it changes, which creates uncertainty for us in our investments and in our return on the investments. Again, that's why consistency is so very important to us. So similar to my question with the assessors on kind of where are we, you know, I think what we're struggling on, on your side when industry comes to us is, are you looking for a better deal from the Department of Revenue because you believe they won't be assessing at the same level or is it a, a regulatory thing where you don't want to be reporting to the seven different counties who all might be assessing you differently and have some you mentioned there may be some incentives for them to tax you higher because there's additional other rates that move up and that county would get more funding and so i guess yeah we're kind of looking for what is it, is it the regulatory structure of having to deal with seven different entities instead of just one state is that how it works in other states in your jurisdiction or is it we think that counties might be going after us more than the state will all of the above <laughs> um it's there is a mixture in across the states and you know uh many jurisdictions we are locally assessed many jurisdictions we are state assessed uh again appeals and litigation at the state level is very rare uh the states typically do not have, you know, their, their budget is not affected by the assessment. So they don't have an incentive to value us higher or lower um, than fair market value or have an incentive to value us at the higher end of a range because they get more money. So again, in our experience, we have a lot of appeals and litigation at the local level in a number of states. Um, again, I'll use Oklahoma as an example because it's probably the worst state. But, um, you know, so we, we like the idea of reporting to one entity. We like the idea of not having to deal with several different, uh, you know, uh, taxing entities. Um, and again, the consistency is, is very important to us. And the fact that we've been state assessed for all these years, um, and it has worked very well. I think for, from the taxpayer's perspective, certainly, we don't like appeals and litigation because it is very expensive and time consuming. Uh, we are not afraid to litigate. Um, you know, we have in other states, um, but we don't, we don't seek that out. We don't like to do it. Um, and again, I, I reiterate, I think the, the lack of appeals and litigation is a positive thing. I think that it's expensive for the taxing authority, it's expensive for the taxpayer. And again, the state doesn't have an incentive to value us lower than fair market value. Any other questions for Nick Stara? Seeing none, thank you much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Anyone else wish to come forward on this bill? It's only 611.
Seeing none. Hey, Miss Huxtable, can I? I need to bring you up for one more question, if I could. Not to delay this, but I do have some questions on appeals and how this works. And so, my ultimate question is really: If the Department of Revenue, um, there was an issue with the industry, you know, the Attorney General's office would defend the Department of Revenue and the appeal, and um, that's covered. If, if and when how this works industry decided to have an appeal and, and go through the process. I guess my question is, do you turn it over to the county attorney or is part of the contract with this company that if there's a, you know, an argument against their assessment, they agree to provide you data information and, and legal help or at least valuation information. Who bears that cost? Is that built into the contract with the company or does that fall under your county attorney if um, a independent power producer were to appeal. Mr. Chairman, um, all the above. Um, so we would go to a normal appeal just like we did for any other local assessed. Our county attorney would be involved. Our contracts do have a clause for the contractor to uh, represent himself and to defend the, the values. Um, there is a cost associated with that depending on everybody's contract. Some of it's probably just travel. Um, I, I don't know the exact terms of mine, but there is a cost associated for them coming to defend their value at, at a local appeal hearing. There is also the opportunity, not talked about it at all, but there is the opportunity in our state statutes to certify a local assessed appeal to the state board. If the county commissioners wish to do that and the county board of equalization were to accept that, and this may be one of those circumstances since it's a, a new philosophy, it's a new tax policy, so to say, that if they were to appeal, and my presumption would be they were going to be appealing in every county that they were located in, um, those could be certified to the state to be heard one time at the state board level if all parties were in agreement, the taxpayer, the county, and this, the board. What will happen, I don't know. My, go my hope is we don't have an appeal, but... <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Since you, I appreciate you bringing Ms. Huxtable back up and asking about the subject of appeals. Let's. So, you you assess different industries, different industrial properties. Um, I've we've heard testimony today that uh, appeals are healthy. You know, a certain amount of appeals are healthy, and then we've heard testimony from the last witness that we never apparently never want to have an appeal. We prefer not to have an appeal. The other industrial classifications that you, uh, industrial property, you assess. Um, do you have occasionally appeals? What, do you have a lot of them? Do you have some? Are they generally healthy and they fix problems or what? I, I, I mean, you've got a lot of experience in this and you assess a lot of things. Sure. He brought her up. Come yeah, on. I did. Go ahead. Um, Chairman Zwanz or uh, Senator Case. Yes, we do have appeals of, of other industries. Um, oil and gas, uh, refineries, um, it, it, probably any kind of industry in the state, we've had an appeal of sorts. The goal is to go through the appeal process and resolve the issue that's there, whether it's an information issue. If it's an opinion of value, which is a lot of times what it is, I just think you're too high. You didn't do anything wrong, it's just too high. Then that's where we end up in a hearing with the litigation and you have all the expense of the expert witnesses and the details. If in many cases, when we have an appeal at a local level, um, those people come in and we do a review process and we go through the information and we try to identify any pieces of data that are missing and try to keep it from going to the formal litigation where we have outside expert witnesses, um, all, all the above. But I have done both. And um, sometimes the problem gets resolved because we get additional information we didn't have or a better understanding of the information and sometimes it goes on up the ladder. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ms. Huxable. Uh, Mr. Haynes online, you're up. Welcome, Spencer. Might not longer be there, Representative Sweeney. Oh, never mind. Mr. Haynes did show up, Pat, so hold tight. Mr. Haynes, floor is yours. Go ahead. We can't hear you, though, Mr. Haynes. I 
Let's make sure it's not us, correct? We don't believe it's us. So how about we'll go to Representative Sweeney and come right back to you in a second, Mr. Haynes. Now? Oh, we can hear you now. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chairman Zwanitzer and um, members of the committee. My name is Spencer Haynes. I'm a Managing Director of Business Development for Duke Energy Sustainable Solutions. I'm responsible for tracking policy and advocating in 43 states outside of our utility footprint. Uh, Duke Energy is a Fortune 150 company headquartered in Charlotte, North Carolina. It's one of the top four utilities in the nation and one of America's largest energy holding companies. Our electric utilities serve 8.2 million customers uh, in uh, seven different states, and we operate over 50,000 megawatts of coal, nuclear, gas, uh, as well as uh, renewables. Our company employs 28,000 people. Uh, we got our start in the wind business here in Wyoming back in 2009 and 2010. Uh, we own four farms in Laramie and Converse counties, Happy Jack, Silver Sage, uh, both in Laramie County, and Sil uh, Campbell Hill and Top of the World in Converse County. Uh, Duke Energy has not and does not currently have any property tax protest pending in Wyoming, and I'm representing Duke here today to, to be proactive about an issue that other states are facing. Uh, in fact, I'm here to provide support for the state assessment of wind power projects. More importantly, we support policies that result and lead to uniform results. Uh, I'd also like to share a little bit more details of what we experienced in Oklahoma a couple of years ago. In Oklahoma had a state ad valorem exemption for wind farms for five years. During those five years, Oklahoma wind farms are centrally assessed. Once the wind farms roll off the five-year ad valorem exemption, wind farms were locally assessed. As more wind farms rolled off central assessment to local assessment, the number of protests and amount in being held escrow in escrow rose dramatically. In the last interim study, as one of the previous speakers alluded to, county assessors represented that more than $80 million was being held in escrow uh, due to protests from the wind as well as oil and gas industry, preventing those same funds from being distributed to schools and other county resources. There was also a backlog of ad valorem protests idling in district court. The interim study identified three primary issues contributing to the increase in protests under local assessment. And I think these three are particularly uh, instructive for uh, the deliberation by this committee. First, the district courts did not have the resources to process the number of protests coming in annually. Second, there was a lack of a standardized methodology for valuation for wind and the oil and gas assets used by third-party appraisals uh, hired by the counties. And three, a lack of communication with the school districts regarding these protests and contested value. After many attempts by the industry and the assessors to solve the process issue over the last 10 years, the Oklahoma legislature took measures this past session to resolve the backlog of protests. HB 3901 provides the option for the protests over $3 million to appeal directly to the Court of Tax Review rather than district court. A second bill, HB 2627, increased the communication between the assessors and the schools, removes third party appraisers from the negotiation of value during a protest and subject communication between third party appraisers and the county assessors to the Oklahoma Open Records Act. This legislation is a significant step forward to resolving decades long issue for Oklahoma. Um, we support a centralized assessment formed by the Department of Revenue in the state of Wyoming. Um, Duke Energy believes that we continue to pay our fair share of taxes. Um, we did have um, we did have a dispute a number of years ago uh, that resulted in about a $200,000 uh, difference, uh, which we did settle with the Department of Revenue. Um, it was over um, whether or not wind turbines were in the state or were they were um, on, their, on their way to Wyoming, so we worked that out um, collaboratively. Uh, we do support the transparency language um, that the speaker from NextEra uh, represented, and I'd be happy to answer any questions, and thank you for the committee's time. Thank you. Questions for Duke Energy? Not seeing any, Spencer. Thanks for being here. Enjoy your day.
Next up, Ribson of Sweeney. And I know, Pat, you can't read the room because you're not here, but if you could do it in one minute or less, we'd be appreciative. Listen to the industry committee. Um, I have nothing against the assessors. They've done a great job. I have nothing against my fellow legislators, but I've been listening to the industry and listen to what they're saying in the fairness aspect. And I think uh, uh, Mr. Haynes, I don't know him, uh, but he really nailed it on the head as far as bringing the facts forth from Oklahoma and what the Oklahoma legislature now had to deal with. We don't need to go there. And um, I think the state has been doing a good job and I'd encourage you to move the bill forward uh, with the amendment uh, provided by uh, the industry evidently. So with that, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Questions for Representative Sweeney. Don't see any, Pat. Thanks for being here. I have one other person in the waiting room with their hand up, but they apparently aren't clicking the button to uh, join the conversation. So. Let me check any other person in the room which testify on this bill. You do, department, at the end of the conversation. <coughs> Welcome. Thanks for bringing the director up with you, who I'd remind everyone was a county assessor for many years. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, Brenda Henson, director of the Department of Revenue and I believe I was the county assessor at the time that Duke brought the appeal from uh, in Laramie County, but um, and the Department of Revenue was valuing that property. But uh, first and foremost, this topic has been discussed uh, a great deal over the past two years. <clears throat> it was certainly not what I anticipated when I made the statement a couple of years ago that. I really do not believe that there is authority within the statute for the Department of Revenue to be valuing independent power producers. Um, that came from a history of where the Department of Revenue had been valuing those historically, basically because they believed that those wind farms were going to be owned by public utility companies, and they began assessing them years ago. Uh, I was not at the Department of Revenue at the time, but I was a county assessor, and I did not question that, uh, had no reason to, and all along I didn't question it. Uh, I ended my career as county assessor in 2013, went to the Department of Revenue, uh, didn't question it then <clears throat> as the property tax administrator. It was only when this discussion came up about trying to coordinate and communicate with county assessors. Uh, you've heard testimony that prior to uh, current administration, there was a hesitancy on the Department of Revenue to share information. When I went to the Department of Revenue's property tax appraiser, I felt the statute was very clear. Under taxpayer provided information, there was a provision that as long as we notified the taxpayer, if the county assessor or county commissioners asked to see the annual reports from that taxpayer that was submitted, we would provide them. And we did. And we started providing them. Uh, we also uh, had discussions with county assessors. Uh, we could not discuss the individual appraisers, um, appraisal of value. We couldn't actually go through that official appraisal because there was information in there that I didn't have access to as far as statutory access to share with the assessor. I have the authority to share the taxpayer provided information. There is no authority for me to share the appraisal that we do on that property. I can only share the assessed value with the assessor. That's what that amendment asks to do um, that has been proposed for this bill. Uh, and we'll do that. We have nothing to hide. Um, we uh, routinely have discussions with county assessors. Communication, I believe, has always been key 
through all aspects in property taxation, communication with the taxpayer, communication with the uh, industry, uh, communication with county assessors, commissioners, all levels, the legislature. <laughs> so with that, um, Brian Judkins is with me. He's the property tax administrator. Uh, he has been uh, on the ground uh, testifying over the past uh, four years on this topic. And I do want him to share some of his experience that he's had. Uh, and uh, with that, my final comment is, this is a policy decision and we will abide by whatever you choose as far as the appraisal authority for these properties. So, Mr. Judkins. Mr. Judkins, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, Director Hanson. Uh, first and foremost, I have no position on this bill, obviously. Um, I can't sit back there and not provide some clarity of what, was, what has been said uh, during uh, testimony. So I know it's getting really late, and I hope I can provide some quick clarity to some of the questions that have been asked. As uh, Director Hansen has said, we can't provide the appraisals, but let me assure you, please let me assure you that we have provided the annual reports of these companies to any assessor that has requested. Let me assure you again, we have provided this information to assessors. Thank you. Um, let, me, let me say this too. The, whether the assessors do this or we do it, we both have the expertise. As Director Henson has said, this is a policy decision that unfortunately relies on you guys. So my staff is totally has the expertise to appraise these. And believe me, you, the assessors have the expertise to appraise these companies. Their third party appraiser appraises thousands of properties throughout the state. We value huge companies with the state. Um, Pacific Corp, they're probably one of the biggest companies in the world. Verizon, um, Burlington Northern, and how we appraise these, you know, there's been, there's been some talk about uh, allocation. We value these companies as a whole. We don't look, we don't start off with property just located in Wyoming. Pacific Corp, we, in, we appraise that entire company as a unitary value. And then we distribute values depending on what assets are located in uh, jurisdictions. We do that with pipelines. We do that with airlines. We do that with um, um, uh, the railroads, uh, rail car, utilities, so on and so forth. There has been some uh, talk about uh, methodologies. Methodologies in appraisal um, with state or department assessed, we uh, value with same methodologies. Within those methodologies, get quite uh, deep and uh, different, um, uh, what do I wanna say? Income, let's say for instance, an income approach is a methodology of appraiser. That's, that's the main methodology that we use to value majority of department assessed companies. Within that income approach, there's a cap rate. Income divided by rate equals value. Simple formula with the income approach. Those cap rates vary significantly or different. They're derived differently based on if they're a rate-based company or not a rate-based company. So yes, they are appraised differently, but methodologies are very similar. Um, as far as uh, rate uh, uh, regulated companies, there's been some talk about rate regulated companies. Um, uh, a lot of the telecoms are not rate regulated. We assess those. We assess airlines that are not rate regulated. Some uh, pipeline companies are not rate regulated. Um, but what I, I, another point I wanted to make is whether we value or the, or the assessors value 
we estimate market value. My staff will estimate market value or the assessors will estimate market value. Will those market values differ? Possibly. Should they differ significantly? Absolutely not. They, they should be very close to one another. So as it has been said earlier, my hope is if it continues down the road where the assessors value these companies that um, uh, the third party appraiser values these quite similar to what my staff has done. And if not, you're damn sure I'm going to find out why there's difference. I will assure you um, why there's differences. We just had anybody have any questions for the department? We're going to close them. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So when you say market value, would you expand on that market value per kilowatt hour market value in comparison? Or are we talking? Just expand on. Sure. Um, market. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Market value. Um, what we appraise is is based on the company. Um, we don't get into uh, kilowatt per hour. Uh, you may be thinking of a production tax. Um, we value the company as what that company is valued at, at a market value. Mr. Ahead. Chairman, Representative Clausen, um, but we do consider power purchase agreements. Uh, in fact, if you have a wind farm, but they don't have a power purchase agreement, then that's going to impact the market value of that property. And so um, when we're looking to appraise a functioning you know, facility, um, Income approach is very important. Anytime you've got a property that's an income approach property uh, or income producing property, we need to look at that income information and, and we do. Um, but you will find that we have had wind farms in the past that they no longer had a purchase power agreement and they didn't have one in the works. And so what is the fair market value of that property on the assessment date? Because it's not generating any income. So there are some definite things that have to be considered in that appraisal process. The key in this discussion is it doesn't matter with it, whether it's us, or it's a county assessor, it'll have to be discussed. So quick yes or no, do you feel any independent power producer company has played games with you on that, that right after the assessment was due, they didn't have a buyer and then magically a week later they did? Mr. Chairman, that, I think that's a really important question. I will tell you with the tax structure in Wyoming, that companies are not making major business decisions based on the taxation, the property taxation in Wyoming. And I'm not specifically speaking of just IPPs and, and wind farms. I'm talking in general, we're the number one state in the nation for doing business um, related to taxes. Senator, another question? Or do you have one that'll go to Senator Case? Yeah, just, just briefly. Based on your relationship with the county assessors and your support of the amendment authorizing the disclosure of the appraisal to them, do you believe, and this is all speculative, but do you believe that if they were able to review that appraisal that they would have a greater understanding of the discrepancies of which they have identified? Ms. Henson? Mr. Chairman, Senator Nethercott, I think um, there will be some assessors that are interested in that information. And we, quite frankly, um, we have other assessors that aren't requesting access to the information that they have lawful legal authority to ask for now. Uh, it's just in particular situations where we see that there's a concern. And I really do understand the questioning of the um, residents of a specific county wanting to make sure, you know, if I'm paying taxes on the 1200 square foot house that I've got, this property that is affecting my view shed, uh, I want to make sure they're paying their taxes as well. And so I, I understand that as an elected official that puts a county assessor sometimes in a bad position. What we encourage those private citizens to do is reach out to us 
Um, the reason that we put a document on our website years ago on how to value wind farms and how we value wind farms, farms was because of both companies and private citizens just wanting to know how we did it because they were new to this state. So that's why the document was posted and it's still there today. Uh, it actually eliminates some of the phone calls we get at our office on trying to understand our, our appraisal methodologies. So I hope that uh, clarifies the question. And I, I did want to share Dixie Huxtable and I sat in the same appraisal course, uh, Tea Garden, uh, in the same course. So we've definitely shared uh, gaining knowledge related to this appraisal industry. Robin Klaus, in question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Director. So in evaluating uh, independent power producers at this market market rate, would it work out to be a similar evaluation through a similar property that's under the regular regulated utility model? I mean, you don't have to use numbers, but are they the same number or is it a completely different methodology? Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Clausen. So when we appraise a property, whether it's the same type of property, you're gonna have different information available. Uh, if it's a brand new wind farm, I don't have an income history, correct? Uh, so all I've got is asset um, cost information. So as that property matures, I've got more information that I can consider. With a rate regulated property, uh, the one thing that we know is the income is affected. And so um, we have a little bit more information on that, but I would say whether it's rate regulated or non rate regulated, the challenge that challenge that we have in appraisal is similar for either. It's just what's the best approach to value based on the information that you've got available. And we've got to consider that and make sure that we're making the right judgment call. And Brian, if you'd like to add to that, I'd I'm sure he so. agrees with you. Yeah, if that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any further question? In our case, can you? Thank you very much for that. But can you reconcile that with uses of the of the unitary approach for appraisal? So it seems like when you say you're using a unitary approach for appraising utilities, you kind of really aren't going out and and evaluating that particular wind turbine standing there yeah, under a unitary approach. Is that right? So I'm, I want to go back on your last answer a little bit, see if you want to revise it. Ms. Henson, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, Senator Case. So the unitary approach is a term that's utilized when we're valuing the company as a whole, okay? But it's an income approach to value. When we value an independent power producer, we're valuing the company as a whole. It's still a unitary approach, but it's an income approach. We're still put, applying a cap rate to net operating income to arrive at what would that property sell for if it were on the open market on January 1st. So I think it's just the terminology that sometimes when we use unit, we talk about a railroad. And then we bring it back to Wyoming and we identify what assets are in Wyoming that we can attribute value to. And then we break it out further into the counties. But unit approach is an income approach. And we can do an income approach on a fourplex, just like we can do it on an IPP. Further questions for the Department of Revenue? Mr. Chairman, if I may. If you may, you may. Thank you, uh, Senator Case. Uh, one more thing on top of uh, what uh, Director Henson was saying with the income approach. Income approaches, we're not worried about nuts and bolts. Yeah. We, we look at company financials. That's how we derive value. It doesn't matter how long the blade is, how tall the tower is, it's company financials. And along with that, real quick, uh, there's, there's a lot of talk on self-reporting. All businesses in Wyoming self-report for personal property. So billions of dollars are self-reported, not with just the state, but with local uh, jurisdictions as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Clausen, another one? One more, I'm just intrigued by this because it's so valuable to my county, but um, are tax credits valued into these market values or caps, federal tax credits that, that end up in the 
of a, end up in these scenarios. Mr. Sure. Chairman. Go ahead. Uh, Representative Clausen. Yes, they are. Further questions to the Department of Revenue? Seeing none. Thank you very much, Brenda. Mr. Brown. Mr. McNiven, you've been waiting patiently. You have the floor. Good luck. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, with the hour and the time and the and the ample debate that has happened so far, um, I will simply say thank you for allowing me to uh, testify on behalf. My name is Travis McNevin on behalf of uh, NEO Renewable Resources. Uh, support the bill and the amendment to uh, can if if the if the committee so chooses uh, for that uh, information to be provided. And again, appreciate everybody's efforts and time on this uh, uh, policy decision of, of uh, where or who um, evaluates and assesses these, these properties with the independent power producers. Uh, thank you. Thank you, any questions? Seeing none, Travis, appreciate you waiting around. Any other public comment on this bill? Going once, going twice. We will close public comment. Committee, what's your pleasure? Move the bill by Representative Blackburn. This is on 23 LSO draft 127. Is there a second? Seconded by Roscoe. Are there any amendments, discussion? Senator Scott. For the LSO, is, <clears throat> is this, am I right in thinking this bill is not on the charge of this committee or the revenue committee uh, for this interim. Mr. Chairman, um, this bill specifically was not on uh, the interim topics. There was the general topic of, of uh, trying to pull it up here right now, but electrical <laughs> production and, and that I think is where it came up Sorry, Mr. Chairman, at our first meeting up in, or our meeting up in Hewlett, um, this came up under the uh, general topic of, uh, of electri electricity, telecommunications and utility uh, regulations. So when the Public Service Commission was testifying, this was one of the bills that was mentioned during that testimony. But the, this bill specifically isn't listed at, on our topic. Senator Scott? Or any other discussion? Well, yep. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, a question for Senator Case. Did the Revenue Committee deal with this topic in this interim? Mr. Chairman, we had a two year topic on electricity taxation. So we, we, you know, we continue. We still have one more meeting left. We wrestled with this topic in the last uh, interim. It's where a lot of this information came out about the authority. Um, I was totally surprised when this topic came forward in the Corporations Committee. And so, uh, you know, that being said, I would hope we wouldn't pass this on. I think we've got really capable county folks who want a chance that it's worth letting them have a chance. And uh, I don't see the bad consequences that everybody's talking about. The development of renewable energies in Wyoming is going to be huge in the future. It's huge now. It's growing. It, uh, it's arguably not uh, contributing enough to our, uh, it's certainly not contributing taxes in the rate that our other industries are. I'm not saying they should, but I'm saying that uh, we have to wrestle with this taxes. We've got counties who care about this very deeply because they get the money. It funds their schools, it funds their cities and towns, counties, special districts, and they see the facilities there, they have access to the facilities. So uh, I don't know what's happened all in the past, Senator Scott, but I, do, I am persuaded that it seems like every time we get an estimation of the benefits of wind to Wyoming, the taxes are way over here. This is going to be this great, and it never comes in that way. So maybe it's time to let the counties have a shot at it. And frankly, I think we're going to be in litigation. Even if we, if you pass this bill, it's not going to, it leaves it unclear for this year. And it puts us in a 
potential litigation. It'd be better, a cleaner approach would be to take it back with the next tax year following, if you, if you think it deserves to be. But I think the counties are going to prove themselves. They're going to do a great job. Further discussion or amendments in the bill? It was moved and seconded. Question. Move, but, did we move the amendment? Yeah. No, we have not moved any amendments. Mr. So, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let's go to Representative Air just because he raised his hand. I move the amendment, um, amendment number one that's been prepared by LSO. And for the members of the public, is this the one in the packet about the department may upon written request? Okay. Discussion on the amendment. Mr. Chairman, I think the testimony of the counties was that this is unacceptable. This doesn't solve the problem. And um, if you think it does as a committee member, then it's, it's window dressing. You just want to believe it. Um, well, I would say the second part of the amendment, um, if this bill passes, is probably necessary to continue um, with where we have been um, the bill would become effective immediately, and then we could still utilize the 2023 tax year if everything went forward. So at least that portion of the amendment, I do think, is important if the bill was to go forward. The other part, I do think it's kind of weird to have this carve out um, in this instance, and I don't know if it actually makes a difference, but open to a further discussion on the amendment. What? Senator Nethercott's looking quickly. <clears throat> what carve out are you referring to, Mr. Chairman? Uh, that subsection R, I just don't believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, that this language exists for any other um, entity or type. It would be kind of this weird, um, when it comes to independent power valuations, that that information could be turned over. But the department can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it would just be kind of specialized for this one section. Mr. Chairman, how do we find the amendment? online um, um, in your yeah in your electronic materials it's the next thing right after the bill on page 227 okay, thank um you. i'm not sure if the amendment was sent out otherwise do you know josh we had a copy of it on our desk yeah i believe there were uh Nobody knows. copies on the desks and also in your e, e notebooks and it's also available on the website the it is in the website meeting materials i believe so mr okay. Okay. And it's in your packet and further discussion committee on the amendment. Mr. Chairman, Senator Case. why is it a may and not a shell? <coughs> Should be a shell if you're going to make sure that the counties can get this. Representative Air, do you find that friendly? Amendment. All right. Is that friendly the second? Second finds that friendly. So department shall upon written request disclose that information. No depart, no um, Department's okay with that? Okay. Further discussion on the revised friendly amendment? And Mr. Chairman, in our case, um, what can a county assessor do with this if they got this information? What good does it do them? They can't act on it. They can't litigate on it. Well, it's, it's, I, it's nothing. They could go to the taxpayer and say, hey, we want you to. But how would they get more money in a new tax rate? They can't. They want it. This is window dressing, you guys. But, Mr. Senator, Chairman. Another cut. The, the committee is smart enough to know what it does and does not do. But I do think that the counties are better off having full access to that appraisal than they are without. And there is no denying that fact. And so once they have that appraisal in their hands, if this bill fails or passes, they will have the ability, which I think it should be its own separate bill, by the way, but we'll just move this in now. Uh, they will have more information to discuss with their constituents and more importantly with us. And I think that's what this is, where this is going and this is what it accomplishes here today. Mr. Chairman, can I ask the, okay, sure. the sponsor a question? How can they discuss this information if it says all information provided under this subsection shall be confidential and no current former official, officer, employer, agent of the state of Wyoming or any political subdivision, including the county office assessor, shall disclose any information obtained by him in connection with his service as an officer and employee? 
How, how, how can they possibly discuss that with someone? It says, any person receiving information pursuant to the subsection shall sign an agreement with the department to keep the information confidential, absolutely confidential. How in the world is, is this of any use to a county assessor? How can they act on it? I do believe Senator Boner is the one who asked for the amendment, and he isn't here currently, but if anyone wants to take a stab at that. Mr. Chairman. Senator Nethercutt. I think we can probably amend the amendment if we need to in the future. However, I don't think it would be unlawful or in violation of this for a county assessor to say, our appraisal is profoundly different. How, how can you say that, Mr. Chairman? I believe that you can. That's my legal opinion. Uh, You're not revealing any information. Sure you are. You're revealing that it's less or more. That's revealing. Uh, no, the appraisal report provides that annual assessment, and that's already re releasable under the law. We've learned that. This is the methodology and the details surrounding that. So it would allow the assessor to go back to the department, at least have a discussion and uh, address their concerns offline, but not really in a public process. We already know the difference in the dollar amounts, mm -hmm. right? This allows them to go, hmm. So, Mr. Chairman. Senator Case, go ahead. In the bigger picture, why, why are we doing this? Do we not care about the taxes that are collected in Wyoming, about the impacts of Wyoming and the future of our landscapes from renewables and all these aspects that will dramatically change our state? Do your constituents not care? Aren't we going to learn a lot by giving the assessors a chance to do it their way once? The department had no authority under the law. They've finally, thankfully, we got this director who, who realized that because nobody knew the difference between utilities and industrial facilities. We do now. We know it very clearly. What are we afraid of? And why are we trying to carry winds water at all costs in this committee? I oppose the bill. This amendment does nothing. Question being called on the amendment. All in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Opposed say no. 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 Show of hands. All in favor of the amendment, raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six. All opposed. One, two, three, four, five. And I don't believe any of our uh, Representative McGuire had to go, and I don't believe Representative LeBeau is back. So that amendment passes. Okay, back on the bill. Further Question on the bill. Question being called as it's late. Josh, if you'd call the roll making 23 LSO 127 a committee bill. Mr. Chairman, Senator Boner submitted an absentee vote of aye. So Senator can I address Senator Boner? Can He's a landowner. He leases to wind farms. Okay. He has a financial interest in this bill. And Senator Boner isn't here to defend himself, and we did start the roll call, so we should continue with the roll. Thank you. Go ahead, Clarissa. Senator Case? No. Senator Nethercott? No. Senator Scott? No. Representative Blackburn? No. Representative Burt? No. Representative Clausen? No. Representative Duncan? Aye. Representative Ayer? Aye. Representative LeBeau, excused. Representative McGuire submitted an absentee vote of aye. Representative Roscoe? Aye. Co Chairman Driscoll? Aye. Chairman Zwanitzer? Aye. Mr. Chairman, we have eight ayes, five noes, one excused. Just guessing that's going to be a house bill to start with. Um, moving on, anybody? I'm optimistic that PBMs, from what I understand, may not be super long of a conversation. So let's not take a break. But as we call Commissioner Root up, um, we'll give 30 seconds for people to maneuver the, um, in and out of the room. Good. All right, committee, we're on farmers. 
we're on pharmacy benefit managers. Um, I guess we're just going to start as this committee is well aware at our Hewlett meeting. We did ask for the Department of Insurance to meet with stakeholders um, as well promising several legislators to be in attendance, which I know based on the election calendar and many of us having um, competitive races, there was not as much legislative participation um, as we had hoped. Um, but I do believe we've had four meetings, uh, Commissioner Rood, and although there is no official uh, legislation before us now, if you could give us an overview, uh, perhaps quickly, of how it's going and where you think it's going this year. Go ahead, floor is yours. Uh, very good. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, committee members, uh, Jeff Rood, the insurance commissioner, as was stated, we were asked to get the parties in a room and see what we could come up with some sort of a consensus. And so uh, what we had done is uh, we had met with PBMs, independent pharmacies, chain pharmacies, insurers, pharmaceuticals, uh, pharmacy service admin organizations, EGI, governor's office, and small business consultants. So we got everybody in a room. We've met four times. Uh, the meetings went from anywhere from two hours to four and a half hours. And it was a warm office that we were in. Uh, uh, it was very warm. Uh, we identified three concerns of the, of the pharmacies, uh, reimbursement, network adequacy, and transparency. And so far, we've worked on eight pages of uh, uh, changes that address the transparency. We're very close to finishing that. We actually have one more meeting scheduled, and I'm confident that we're going to be able to come up with this uh, eight-page document that will address transparency. That leaves the other two issues. All the parties are still willing to continue and to work at it. And, and so uh, we'll continue to do that. I guess we're at a point where we have to decide with some direction from the committee what you want us to do. I think we're going to be able in mid-November to come up with eight pages that address one of the three concerns. Do you want us to pass it to LSO for them to draft? I'm not sure where we want to go with that. And in the meantime, we can keep working uh, and keep getting the parties together and as long as it's productive I'll continue to do what we're doing which is really facilitate at this point thank you mr. chairman um director what were the other two besides transparency I wasn't uh, typing fast enough sorry mr. chairman uh, representative Duncan uh, it was reimbursement and network adequacy network adequacy adequacy thank you other questions or Mr. Chairman? Senator Case. I think that's a great plan, but this committee has no way to process a bill and get it as a committee bill. But there probably are individuals that like to do that, and I encourage them to work with the commissioner and the working group and do so in that manner. And I do believe that would happen if there was a bill that's agreed upon by all members or most members that you would have legislators bring that forward and we would talk about the working group and what transpired this interim. Um, so before you go too far, there's no other questions. I might call up a couple other people just to testify, make sure they're on the same page and um, see where we're going from there. So anyone else? Ms. Carol, come on down. Chairman, committee members, I'm Melinda Carroll. I'm here representing the Wyoming Pharmacy Association. Um, and while we are appreciative of the work that has been done um, and the agreements that we've been able to come to, the Pharmacy Association and those that I represent are most, most concerned about those other two issues. Transparency was our third priority. Reimbursement was our first. Um, freedom of choice or network adequacy was our second which have not been addressed yet. We do have drafted language for that, that we hope to come to agreement on. Um, that is what the coming meetings should be for, I would think, um, but that's yet to be determined. So I would agree with the commissioner's assessment of the situation, but would encourage um, further participation and kind of a look at that, of those top two priorities. With that, I'd stand for questions. It might be fair to say that uh, your association's priorities might be the inverse of um, the PBM's priorities when it comes to um, moving forward on all these issues. Is that fair? Um, yes, Chairman, I would say that that is a fair assessment of what we would say. 
Questions, pharmacy, Representative Duncan. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So my question is, do you feel like you've gotten any movement and some, some dialogue going on compared to where you were? Go ahead. Uh, Chairman, Representative Duncan, yes, um, I do feel like we have made progress with dialogue. Um, we have had good commitments from the industry stakeholders on coming back to the table and talking about those top two priorities of ours. Um, we would like to see some agreement on some of the language that um, the pharmacy stakeholders have provided because we feel that it is um, a significant compromise from Senate File 36 with what we have drafted. Um, so we feel that based on that, we're showing a good faith attempt at compromise and we'd like to see it, you know, reciprocated. Quick follow up. Follow up. Thank you. Mr. Um, Mr. Chairman, so, so you got one third. So I'm feeling pretty impressed that you guys have two third, you know, you only have two more parts. So do you feel like you could, you, you've got a good momentum. Do you feel like you guys can, um, since you've got some good cohesion and you've got the ball rolling, do you feel like you're able to get to the finish line? Chairman, um, Representative Duncan, yes, I do feel that we have good momentum and that we should be able to get the ball rolling on those other two topics. Um, one of them has been a little bit more contentious than the other. Um, so I'm not sure if all parties will be able to come to an agreement on one of them at least, but um, we're hopeful that the reimbursement issue won't be as contentious. Again, we have um, made significant compromises from Senate File 36, and I think that that's been recognized. As for the freedom of choice or network adequacy, that one is more of a sticking point for people. And so that's um, discussion that has added to those very long meetings in the warm rooms. Last question, Mr. Sure. Chairman. So if you were able to get two out of three to move forward, would you be success? Um, Chairman, Representative Duncan, if we were able to get two out of three, that would um, be a measure of success for us, yes, and it would help um, independent pharmacies and pharmacies in general to be able to help the, the constituents of Wyoming have access to health care. Um, I would say that we would be back in the future to pursue the other topic. Any other questions for the Pharmacy Association? Seeing none, anyone else wish to testify on the PBM topic while you're all here? Okay. Sounds like a good plan. So with that committee, everybody's generally in agreement. We'll encourage you to keep working. I would imagine um, the 2023 year, we will also encourage further um, work on the PBM issue and keep that working group probably going um, either in this committee or in another one to make sure we get to where uh, most of us are hoping we get to. We're not quite there yet, but I hear from all sides that they're finding common ground. I know the federal government is also working on similar issues as all other states are as well. So um, thank you again, Commissioner Rood, for handling, um, hurting the cat, shall we say. And it's a lot of work and we're, we are appreciative. Um, before we adjourn for the evening, is there any other public comment to come before corporations tonight? Going once. Let me make sure there's no one online. Not seeing anyone. So with that committee, we will be back at 830 tomorrow to talk about election issues. Um, enjoy your evening. You can leave your stuff here locked if you'd want. Have a good night. <laughs>